did not get much sleep. If I nod off, wake me up. got a lot of stickers on your laptop. That's, you don't have any room for any more. So as you know, I'm a, I'm a part-time instructor, have been since 2009, and uh, I'm excited whenever I have the opportunity to uh, address the first and second year classes, as well as those who are watching online. Today, I'm going to teach an introduction of the parables, and then we're going to focus upon a number of the kingdom parables. And these are truly stories that change the world. In Matthew chapter 13, Verses 1 through 3. The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore, and he spake many things unto them in parables. This had been a busy day in the life of our Lord. A key event that transpired on this day was the Pharisees' accusation that Jesus was casting out demons by the power of Satan. The confrontation that followed marked a turning point in the ministry of Jesus. One result was that Jesus changed his preaching style during the final year or so of his public ministry. In Mark 4, 33 through 34, and with many such parables spake he the word unto them as they were able to hear it. But without a parable, spake he not unto them, and when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. There was an intentional change in teaching style that took place about the same time that Jesus' Galilean ministry entered its final phase. It was a sudden and striking shift, and it was a response to hard-hearted, deliberate unbelief and rejection. More and more of his public teaching was done through parables. Now, other people used parables before Jesus came along. Nathan used one to make David realized the enormity of his sin in 2 Samuel 12. Isaiah told the parable of the vineyard of wild grapes in Isaiah 5, 1 through 7. But no one comes near him in the lovely way in which he used them. In this chapter, the Lord addressed the crowd, Matthew 13, that is, and taught his first great group of parables. In my Dixon New Analytical Bible, it has a chart. I'll show you this chart a little bit later. 
but it is a chart on the parables in chronological order. And it divides them into the second and third period of the Galilean ministry, the Perean ministry, and then the Passion Week. The Lord presented three great groups of parables in all. The first group was during the second period of the Galilean ministry. The second group was during the Perean ministry. That's found in Luke 15, 1 through 16, 31. The third group was during the Passion Week. That's found in Matthew 21, 23 through 22, 14 and related passages in Mark and in Luke. On this occasion in Matthew 13, the Bible says he spake many things in parables. I should point out this is not the first time, though, that Jesus used a parable. In Luke's account of the Sermon on the Mount, in Luke 6:39, it says, And he spake a parable unto them. Can the blind lead the blind, and they not both fall into the ditch? When Jesus ate with Simon the Pharisee, he told the story of the two debtors in Luke 7, 41 and 42. What was different about the occasion was the Lord's extensive and exclusive use of parables. Matthew 13, 34 all these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them. The primary thrust of that is in reference to Jesus' teaching at this time by the Sea of Galilee. Following that period of teaching, Jesus did speak to the people using methods other than parables, but from that time on, parables played a much larger role in his teaching. Instead of using parables to illustrate his teaching, parables became an instrument of his teaching. Jewish rabbis used parables often. Hillel the Elder was one of the most uh, famous and influential rabbis of, of all time. He lived a generation before the birth of Christ, and he is said to have spoken occasionally in parables. However, it was Jesus who perfected the parabolic method of teaching. Over one-third of Jesus' teaching was in parabolic form. He was the master teacher. At the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 7, 28 and 29, and it came to pass when Jesus ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. And later, when some officers reported to the chief priest, they said in John 7, 46, never man spake like this man. The Lord's teaching was so unique because of its originality, its truthfulness, its authoritativeness, and its simplicity. The Lord employed various techniques in teaching the truth, but certainly one of his favorite methods of teaching was parables. Parables differ from fables in that parables deal with realistic happenings, whereas fables deal with unrealistic uh, occurrences like Animals speaking, mountains moving, or trees speaking a message to man. 
For example, in uh, Judges chapter 9, after Gideon died, we read about an unworthy leader named Abimelech who pushed himself into a place of leadership. And when Jotham, the youngest son of Gideon and the only one who had escaped death, learned of what had happened, he went to the top of Mount Gerizim and cried unto the men of Shechem the fable of the Bramble King. That's the oldest fable known. It's called a fable since the word refers to a narrative in which either animals or inanimate things are said to speak and act like human beings. In literature, Aesop's fables would be another illustration of that form. So remember, parables deal in realistic happenings or actual occurrences whereas fables deal with unrealistic happenings. Parables also differ from allegories in that allegories involve little or no comparisons while parables are filled with comparisons. An allegory like Paul's in Galatians 4, 21 through 31 is largely self-interpreting while the parable demands attention and insight, and occasionally a full explanation. So I want us to consider in this introduction three questions pertaining to parables, which I believe to be helpful to us in our study of God's Word and in the proper application of it in our lives. Number one, what is a parable? Number two, why did Jesus speak in parables? And three, how should parables be studied interpreted, and applied to us today. Number one, what is a parable? Our English word parable is a Greek word that has been transliterated or written out with English letters. It occurs 50 times in the New Testament. In the King James Version, it's translated comparison once, Mark 4.30. Twice it's rendered figure, Hebrews 9.9, Hebrews 11.19. And once proverb, Luke 4.23. And 46 times it's simply found as parable. The word is derived from two roots. Para, which means beside, and balo, which means to throw. And so it simply means to place beside, to cast alongside. A parable then is a story that places one thing beside another for the purpose of teaching. It puts the known next to the unknown so that we can learn God's truth. It's an extended simile, a comparison, a likeness. When Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like so-and-so, he's using a comparison or contrast to teach a spiritual lesson. The parables of our Lord are found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The book of John does not use the word parabole, but he uses a different Greek word. Paroimia. That's P-A-R-O-I-M-A. Paroimia. That word means an adage or a proverb. It is once rendered in the King James as parable in John 10 and verse 6. 
the familiar definition of a parable, which I was taught in Sunday school, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Have you heard that? Yes, sir. That does not say it all, but it does say a lot. It certainly fits some of the better known parables, such as the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke 10, 30 through 37, and the parable of the lost son, Luke 15, 11 through 32. But it would be hard to classify some parables as stories. For example, in Luke 6 and verse 39, and he spake a parable unto them, can the blind lead the blind? Both shall fall into the ditch. And that's the end of it. Giving a, a technical definition that fits all of Jesus' parables is notoriously difficult because of the range of sayings that are called parables. And what you find is people are not agreed as to how to divide them. The Bible does not formally distinguish between the parable, the proverb, the similitude, or even the allegory. Brother B.W. Johnson wrote, The parable differs from the proverb in being a narrative from the fable in being true to nature, from the myth in being undeceptive, and from the allegory in that it veils the spiritual truth. The story parable. It has a story or plot with a beginning and an ending, like the Good Samaritan usually making one main point. Similitude. This word means an imaginative comparison. Similitudes are extended similes made from statements, but not woven into a story. Parables like the leaven, mustard seed, and the sower more nearly resemble similitudes. The wise builder and foolish builder of which Jesus spoke in Matthew 7, 24 through 27 is an example of similitude, though some would call that a parable. Next you have allegory, metaphor. John 10, 1 through 16 is where Jesus presents himself as the good shepherd. I mentioned a moment ago that this is called parable in the King James Version, but it is not parabole. It is from the Greek word Paroimia. And I told you that means an adage or proverb. Some would say that John 10 is more of an allegory, an extended metaphor, because there are so many points of comparison. Some have called the vine in the branches in John 15 a parable. However, it's not called a parable in the scriptures. It's more rightly classified as an allegory. And while those two, John 10 and John 15, are called parables on some list made by man, most would say that there are no true parables found in the book of John. And so on that chart in my Dixon's New Analytical Bible, 
it does not include any parables in the book of John, only Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Next, you have proverbs or parabolic sayings, short statements like Luke 4.23. He said unto them, You shall surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in, this, in thy country. Well, in that verse, we have the Greek word for parable. However, we would call that a proverb. And that is how the King James Version translated it. You will surely say unto me this proverb. In Mark 7, 15 through 17, there is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. If any man hath ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was entered into the house from, from the people, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. So that is called a parable but it's actually a pair of simple propositions that are stated like a riddle. It has none of the distinctive elements of story or narrative, no plot, no characters, no series of events. Yet scripture calls it a parable, not only in Mark 7:17, 7, but also in Matthew 15:15. 15, 15. So obviously then the biblical idea of parable is broader than some technical definitions that are proposed by various commentators about parables. When you look at the different listings of Jesus' parables, you will find passages that could be classified as similes, metaphors, allegories, similitudes, or other comparative figures of speech. I mentioned Jesus teaching about the two builders at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. We sing that in VBS, right? Well, that's long been called a parable by us, but it's not called a parable in the scriptures. And in that passage, the comparison is clear. This is a similitude. It's an extended simile where you have comparisons being made using like or as. Dungan, who wrote our textbook on hermeneutics, said it would have been a parable if the same thought had been put into the form of a story and exhibited that way. It's difficult to say how many parables are present in the gospel accounts. I don't know that I can give you an exact number. The exact number depends on your definition of a parable. If the word parable is taken to include proverbs, and riddles and similitudes as well as those in story form then the number is about 60 not counting all of the parabolic statements the number is usually estimated between 30 and 40 35 and 40 that Dixon's chart lists 31. By the way, let's, let's show that chart. There it is. And you see none listed in John. They list 31. And as I mentioned to you earlier, they broke them up into the Galilean ministry, the Perean ministry, and the Passion Week. I have two books written by Neil Lightfoot on the parables. He provides a more comprehensive list of the parables according to their location. 
he lists 46. So the number varies. This is a chart that you'll see more than once today. I like it because the parables of Jesus can be grouped along a certain theme. And the following does not classify every parable. But what it does do is it gives you some proper uh, or possible groupings of parables. And there can be overlapping uh, as well. You have the kingdom parables. That's going to be our focus. Sower, tares, mustard seed, leaven, hidden treasure, pearl of great price, Dragnet. Those are all from Matthew 13. Laborers in the vineyard. By the way, he's got their Matthew 21. Well, even Homer nodded. He messed up there. That's chapter 20. That's chapter 20. Two sons, Matthew 21. Wicked husbandman, Matthew 21. Secret seed, Mark 4. Great supper, Luke 14. And then the wedding feast, Matthew 22. Then the lost parables, or as this chart has, center parables. All Luke 15. Lost coin, lost sheep, lost son. I was amazed to find that some include the leaven here due to a misapplication of that parable, but I do not. Then you have the forgiveness parables, unprofitable servants, Luke 17, unmerciful servant, Matthew 18, two debtors, Luke 7. Prayer parables, friend at midnight, Luke 13, unjust judge, Luke 18, Pharisee and the publican, Luke 18. Stewardship parables. Talents, Matthew 25. Pounds, Luke 18. Rich fool, Luke 12. Service parable. Good Samaritan, Luke 10. Preparation parables. Barren fig tree, Luke 13. Unjust judge, Luke 16. Marriage of king's son, Matthew 22. Ten virgins, Matthew 25. And when we talk about overlapping, I would also list there parable of the talents, Matthew 25, which he chose to include in stewardship parables, and that's fine. But of course, it's also a preparation parable too, isn't it? So there's overlapping. So I'm utilizing these seven groupings, and we're doing that in this seminar. I'm dealing with kingdom parables, Brother Bland is dealing with some preparation parables. And then Brother Liddell is dealing with the lost parables or the center parables. So I'm utilizing these seven groupings. But there's overlapping. Now, the marriage of the king's son, Matthew 22... The ten virgins, Matthew 25. The talents, Matthew 25. All begin with what phrase? The kingdom of heaven. So, I could have included them in my kingdom parables, right? But talents is being grouped in stewardship parables. Marriage of the king's son and ten virgins are being grouped with preparedness parables. And as I said, talents could fit in there too. The parables of Jesus include images drawn from daily experience. It speaks of ordinary, common things. When he talks about the sheep, the boys, the coins, the trees, the customs, the plants, he's associating the unknown with the known. After having heard a parable, 
a listener might mentally refer to the fresh spiritual meaning which Jesus taught whenever he encountered these earthly images. And because the images were taken from daily experience, an ancient listener could easily remember the meaning of the parable. These parables carry a message of hope, forgiveness, relationship, meaning, and purpose to humanity. And they clearly reveal to us that God is interested in our daily lives. Question number two, why did Jesus speak in parables? Well, there's no finer passage in all the Bible relative to the purpose of parables than Matthew 13. The disciples were hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And the Lord's extensive use of parables on that occasion surprised his disciples. Matthew 13, 10, And the disciples came and spake unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? They say that after the Lord had taught them the parable of the sower. And before that, the Lord hadn't really used this teaching method much. And now at this point in his preaching and teaching ministry, he's about to teach one parable after another. Matthew 13 is filled with parables. Well, the question was logical. And the Lord's reply to their questions is very helpful to us. Someone read Matthew 13, 11 through 13. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whatsoever, or excuse me, for whosoever hath to whom shall be given, and he shall have more abundance, but whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they, they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not. Neither do they understand. Here Jesus tells us why he used parables. First of all, Jesus spake in parables to reveal truth to the open-minded. Of course, that's why he came to earth, Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. And yet all were not of the disposition to be saved. At this time in the Lord's ministry, there were already two well-defined classes. There were those loyal to him, and there were those who loathed him. Well, to those loyal, the mysteries of the kingdom were given. And mysteries refer not to incomprehensible matters, but to principles not yet revealed. Parables were used to reveal truth to the open-minded. When you consider the purpose of parables, Think about their positive value. Parables capture our attention. Almost everybody likes a story, right? Parables stimulate our thinking. They make us ask, well, what does this mean? Third, parables enlighten our understanding. They illustrate abstract principles. And then fourth, parables facilitate our retention. In other words, they're easy for us to remember. And so parables aid us in our understanding and appreciation of spiritual concepts. Parables were used to reveal the truth to honest hearers. They help people understand the unknown by a comparison with the known. Second of all, Jesus spake in parables to conceal truth from the closed-minded. When Jesus' disciples asked him why he was teaching with parables, he chose not to focus on the positive, but on the negative. 
In verse Matthew 13, 13, Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. To those that loathed the Lord, the revelation would be concealed. To such people, truth would be like, like pearls cast where? Before swine. Matthew 7, 6. But to those people that treasured truth, more truth would be given. From those that could have had the truth yet turned from it in rebellion, it would be taken away. D.R. Dungan said parables were for the purpose of concealing truth from the minds of those who had no right to it or who would abuse it if it were given to them. In Matthew 13, 14, and 15, someone read that. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of uh, Isaiah, which said, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have, they have closed. And as at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Here that's a quote from Isaiah 6, 9, and 10. He quoted a prophecy found there and that referred to them. They would hear God's word but not understand it. They would see God's power at work but not perceive what he was doing. Again, keep in mind the context by accusing Jesus of casting out demons by whose power? Beelzebub. They were demonstrating that their hearts were gone. They were hardened beyond repair. It would be obvious that they would not listen to the truth that Jesus would share, and rather they would find uh, some way to trap him. So it was in this hostile environment that Jesus spake many un things unto them in parables. All right, Matthew 13, 16, and 17, someone. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. So here he draws a sharp, clear contrast between open eyes in search of truth and closed eyes found among the hardened of heart, between the dull ears that refuse to hear the truth and eager ears, eager to hang on every word of it. Now, a number of years ago, I read a bulletin article which was unlike anything I had ever read before. It was written by Brother Bill McDonough, and he had emailed this article from the nation of Myanmar. That used to be called Burma. And because of the dangerous and hostile political climate there, it was necessary for Brother Bill to speak in parables. He had to use veiled language when referring to spiritual topics. So I'm going to take the time to read this article for illustration purposes. And as I do that, I'm going to give you some explanation to help clarify Bill's meaning so you'll understand, okay? The title of it is, A Wonderful Livestock Show. Now that's a non-threatening title, isn't it? A wonderful livestock show. By that he means preacher training school. He wrote, 43 of the best specimens, that's prospects, from the Delta region were brought to this month's livestock show, preacher training school. Heifers, that's women, and bulls, 
That's men. We're brought for further training, and many of the older members of the herd, that's church, are developing into outstanding specimens. That's leaders. This time they were being taught to lead as the Delta region is wild and needs strong bulls or men to lead and protect the herds, churches, from many pitfalls, thieves, and wolves. They were also given help in learning to care for their young, and considerable time was spent on the importance of propagation of the herds to keep the good bloodlines growing. That's teaching the new Christians to teach the gospel to others to expand the kingdom. Seven calves were born, converted, during the week-long activities. So three of the nine villages represented took home additional livestock, Christians, who got off to a good start in life and will be nourished with the sincere milk. The total herd, church, strength in this region continues to grow and develop. Who would have thought that a typhoon three years ago would be the door opener for these herds, churches, to begin to be fed and develop into groups of whom you would all be proud? It has happened because of you, and you will one day meet the shepherds in their flocks who will thank you forever and ever. Well, that was creative, wasn't it? When I was thinking about this seminar, my mind went back to this modern-day parable. It's unlike anything I've ever read. Why did Brother Bill choose to write this way? Uh huh. He was in a hostile environment. Right? And so he used this parable to reveal the truth of what had occurred to their supporters, to those that love the truth, while concealing the truth from those who hated it. So that's a modern day example. It helps us to understand why Jesus spake in parables. Jesus taught in parables to conceal the truth from the hardened of heart and reveal the truth to those eager to receive it. Third, Jesus spoke in parables to fulfill the Old Testament prophecies that he said that said he would use them. Matthew 13, 34 through 35. Psalm 49, 4, Psalm 78, 2. And we know these refer to Christ because he refers to them here. One of Matthew's purposes in writing his book was to show how Jesus Christ in his life and teachings fulfilled the Old Testament scriptures, that it might be fulfilled. That's one of his key statements. Matthew 1.22, Matthew 2.15, Matthew 2.17, Matthew 2.23, Matthew 4.14. 4, well, let's stop right there. That clock says 10 o'clock. Let's take a break.
Jesus used parables as a divider. They divided the superficial from the serious and sincere. They divided those who held to him from those who hated him. They were a test of character. Fifth, Jesus used parables to elicit self-condemnation from his enemies before they realized what they had self-disclosed. The parable of the wicked husbandman would be an example of this. They would cause men to assert or assent to the truth before they realize its application to them. Of course, Nathan the prophet did that with David with his parable of the ewe lamb. Six, Jesus used parables to encourage a deeper and richer search for truth. And when it was found, it became even more precious. Seventh, Jesus used parables to embellish and immortalize truth by the nobility of simple yet sublime narratives. D.R. Dungan said they were for the purpose of embalming the truth, that it might not be forgotten. And this he did with remarkable success. Jesus really perfected the parabolic method of teaching. He was the master teacher. At the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, 28 and 29, it came to pass when Jesus ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. And later when some officers reported to the chief priest, John 7, 46, the officers answered, Never a man spake like this man. Truly the Lord's teaching was unique. Third, how should parables be studied and interpreted? At least one-third of the Lord's recorded teaching is found in parables. And to ignore the parables is to rob ourselves of much that the Lord wants us to learn. The parables are both mirrors and windows. As mirrors, they help us to see ourselves. They reveal our lives as they really are. As windows, they help us to see life and to see God. Now there are several guidelines for studying the parables. Number one, study each parable in its context. Of course, that's true of any portion of Scripture, right? Yes, sir. Yes, but it's especially true of the parables. You ignore the context, and you can make a parable teach almost anything. So you want to identify the original audience. To whom was the parable told? Was it to the multitude? Was it to the religious leaders? Or was it to the disciples? Then you want to look at the immediate context. And sometimes there's a brief introduction in the passage which affects its meaning. For example, Luke 12, 13. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. Jesus then told the parable of the rich farmer. Luke 18, 1, he spake a parable unto them to this end, 
that men ought always to pray and not to faint. What follows is the parable of the persistent widow. Luke 19, 11, And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable, because he was nigh to Jerusalem, and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. What follows is the parable of the pounds. So carefully look to see if there is a brief introduction. Sometimes parables are grouped thematically. There's a main thread that can help our understanding. In Luke 15, 2, And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners, and eateth with them. Well, there's your brief introduction. And after that, Jesus told what parables? Lost sheep. Lost coin. Lost, lost boy. So that helps us to understand the gracious heart of God. Also, look at the wider context. Know which book of the Bible the parable is in and where it appears in the book and how it fits with the book's themes. We shall be studying the kingdom parables of Matthew. Well, that fits the theme of Matthew, which is the king and his kingdom. Matthew rings with the announcement that the ministry of Jesus of Nazareth heralds the impending arrival of the kingdom of heaven. The phrase kingdom of heaven occurs 33 times and the similar kingdom of God is found four places. John the Baptist, the Lord himself, and the disciples proclaim that the coming kingdom was near. 3 2, 4 17, 10 7. And as they went forth preaching the good news of the kingdom, those qualities that were characteristics of its citizens were being stressed. And so we have a number of parables which teach us what the kingdom of heaven is like. Luke uh, chapters 10 through 19, there's a strong theme of commitment and discipleship in practical areas of life. And there are several parables about stewardship, like the rich fool in Luke 12 or the pounds in Luke 19. Number two, consider the cultural background. A good example of that would be the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25. That story has to be understood in the cultural context of Jewish marriage customs at the time of Jesus. He took illustrations from everyday life and he spake about things like people sowing seed by hand or using yeast to bake bread, looking for lost sheep, traveling down the dangerous road from Jerusalem to Jericho and pouring new wine into old wineskins. So we have to explain the cultural background of these references so that the impact of the parable is properly conveyed. Number three, look for the main truth the parable teaches. I want to illustrate that with the parable of the Good Samaritan. The parable of the Good Samaritan is intended to answer the question. What question? Who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? The, uh, the story of the ten virgins is a warning to, to watch, for we know not the day nor the hour when the Lord doth come. 
warning. Don't treat a parable like an allegory. An allegory is most often completely filled with symbolic meaning. Every detail means something that can be traced to the overriding principle. In ancient and medieval times, it was customary for people to treat parables of Jesus as allegories. And not just parables, they did a lot of things that way. By the end of the second century, there were three great Christian schools. There was one in Alexandria, Egypt. There was the school of Asia Minor. That was in Antioch of Syria. And then there was the school of North Africa. That was in Carthage. But perhaps the most important one was the one in Alexandria, Egypt. It was founded around 150. And it sought to apply a Jewish technique of allegory to relate Christian teaching to Greek philosophical thought. Pantaneus was its founder. He and Clement stood at its head in the second century. Origen, Heracles, and Dionysius in the third, and then Didymus the Blind in the fourth. The most active period of that school was about 200 to 400 A.D. Origen, who lived from 185 to 254, was asked to lead this school at the ripe old age of 18. 18. I want to read to you Origen's interpretation of the parable of the Good Samaritan. The man who fell among robbers is Adam. Jerusalem represents heaven, and Jericho, since it was away from Jerusalem, represents the world. The robbers are man's enemies, the devil and his comrades. The priest stands for the law, the Levite for the prophets, and the good Samaritan for Christ himself. The beast on which the wounded man was placed is Christ's body which bears the fallen Adam. The inn is the church, while the two pens are the father and the son. The good Samaritan promises that he will come back again, so Christ Jesus will come again at the end of the world. Of that interpretation, Neil Lightfoot said, the whole thing is a rather ridiculous interpretation. But for many centuries, this is the kind of interpretation that was offered for the parables. Parables usually have one basic central meaning. Look for the central truth which the parable sets forth. Trying to over symbolize them can have the effect of, of tearing them apart. A person doesn't understand the beauty of a flower by disassembling it entirely, petal by petal. What's the point of the parable of the Good Samaritan? Jesus was teaching love for neighbor. The lawyer, wanting to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Luke 10, 29. And after Jesus told the parable, the question that he asked was not, Who is represented by the Good Samaritan? It was, Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves. And he said, He that shall have mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto them, unto him, Go and do thou likewise. Luke 10, 36 through 37. 
I think Origen missed the point, don't you? Now, I had a member recently who visited another congregation and told me that the preacher had preached on the Good Samaritan. And she said that preacher had us represented by the man who was robbed and how we are in need of mercy. Well, certainly, we need mercy, right? However, the Lord's point to the lawyer was not to see himself as the man who was robbed and beaten, but as who? The Good Samaritan. As the one who was neighbor to the robbed man and told him what? Go and do thou likewise. Lawyer, you need to go and be like the good Samaritan. So my point is, let's not miss the point that Jesus plainly made. We need to handle right the word of God, and that's just not it. Some people call that making a parable walk on all fours. It's an example of spiritualizing the parable of the Good Samaritan like Origen did. It shows what can happen if you try to attach meaning to every little detail. You ignore the context, and as I said, you can make a parable teach almost anything. But what's the context? The context is the lawyer's evasive question. And the fundamental lesson is that of being a neighbor to those who are in need. And don't we need that lesson? Yes, sir. Instead of trying to make the parable walk on all fours and trying to spiritualize everything and act like we've come up with something new that everybody else has missed. Not realizing that Origen was making the same mistake in the second century. We're not ahead of him. Number four. Determine the different messages of the parable. Different parts of the parable impacted the hearers differently. For example, in the parable of the two debtors, Luke 7, 36 through 50, the sinful woman would be represented by the first debtor with a debt of 500 pieces of silver. And Simon the Pharisee would be represented by the second debtor owning 50 pieces of silver. In the parable of the prodigal son, who's represented by the elder brother? Pharisees and scribes. Luke 15 and verse 2. What parables did Jesus explain? Sower and tares. First two we'll look at today. We ought to learn from that explanation. Number five. Don't press the language of a parable beyond its intended design. For example, the parable of the tares has often been abused to teach that no discipline of any kind ought to be practiced by the church since the Lord said that the evil and good should be allowed to grow together. But that misses the point of the parable since the field is the world and not the church. Matthew 13, 38. Number six. Observe key words and phrases. Jesus' parables use certain phrases and key words that communicate in powerful ways to his audiences. For instance, how much more is used to build a bridge 
from temporal things to spiritual realities. He who has ears to hear calls people to critical uh, issues of spiritual life and death. Verily, verily, I say unto you, means Jesus is speaking with earnest intensity. Don't miss it. Understanding. That's a key concept in Matthew 13. In fact, the word understand occurs five times in verses 13, 14, 15, 19, and 23. The kingdom of heaven is like points to lessons about the kingdom. Matthew 13, 24, 31, 33, 44, 45, 47. So look for these phrases and understand where they're leading you. And then number seven, watch for the surprise twist. Have you picked up on the fact that many parables have a surprise twist? I mean, in the Good Samaritan, what's the surprise twist? The Samaritan was a Hindu. Yeah, he wasn't a Jew, was he? It wasn't a Jew who acted like a, a good neighbor by stopping and helping the injured man. It was a Samaritan. Well, to the Jews, Samaritans were what? Unclean, despised, outsiders. And yet it's the Samaritan that's the neighbor to the man who's robbed. It's common for a young man to waste his father's wealth and want to return home. But it's unusual to hear of a father who warmly receives such a thoughtless son back home. That's a surprise twist. It's common for a sheep to wander from the flock. But it's unusual for a shepherd to leave the whole flock to go and search for one sheep. It's no surprise for a person to build up a large debt. But it is surprising to find a banker who forgives such a sum. So the surprise endings of Jesus' parables challenge us to think in new and different patterns. We can see something we haven't seen before an insight into the way that God works. And the surprise of Jesus' parables can open our hearts to the mysteries of God. All right? Question four. How shall we best use the parables? Let's look at one short parable which really explains how best to use the parables in general. Turn to Matthew 13, 51. This is the parable of the householder. Matthew 13, 51, Jesus saith unto them, Have you understood all these things? They say unto him, Yea, Lord. Well, understanding always means responsibility. The disciples were privileged to understand hidden truths. And therefore, they had a great responsibility to put those truths into what? Into practice. So Matthew 13, 52, Then said he unto them, Therefore every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that is a householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. 
Now in that statement, which is a brief, very brief parable, he points out three responsibilities that we have toward God's truth. Number one, we have the responsibility of learning the truth. A scribe's work was to examine the law and discover its teachings. But sadly, many of the scribes were more interested in protecting their dead tradition than in teaching living truth. We must learn the truth. Number two, we have the responsibility of living the truth. To be his disciple, we must put his truth into practice. We learn the truth to live the truth. This is my sermon for Sunday, by the way, applying the truth. James 1. James says, it's not enough to be hearers of the word, we have to be what? Doers, Doers of the word. Doers of, word, of the word. You've got the forgetful hearer and you've got the blessed doer. James 1. Third, we have the responsibility of leaving the truth with others. Our treasury of spiritual truth must be left with others. It has to be shared like the householder did. And we need to endeavor to do that in just in every way that we can. I think about Ezra. What was Ezra? He was a scribe, and he exemplified that kind of life. In Ezra 7.10, for Ezra prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. Here's the scribe, learning. And to do it, here is the disciple, living and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. Here's the householder, leaving the truth with others. Learning, living, leaving. And what a great example that is for us to follow. Okay, now I've got to make a decision here. So we're at 1039. Do I do an introduction to the parables of the kingdom or do I just go straight to the parables? What do we want? You want the introduction? Okay. Okay, so we'll do introduction to the parables of the kingdom. And there'll be some things in here maybe you hadn't heard much about before, so that'll be helpful to you. The series of parables that I've been assigned are windows into the kingdom of God. They show us in a variety of ways and from a variety of angles what it means to live as citizens of God's kingdom and under King Jesus. What kingdom is in view? Now, I read with great interest how certain people deal with the kingdom parables. What kingdom's in view? Well, some teach that the kingdom simply refers to the rule and reign of God. Others teach this is referring to a millennial kingdom to come. Others say there's a spiritual aspect of the kingdom in effect now and the aspect of the kingdom program that involves the physical earthly reign of Christ is definitely going to happen in the future. So there's a lot of confusion out there. Although occasionally Matthew uses the term kingdom with reference to heaven. Matthew 8.11, Matthew 25.34. Generally, the word is used synonymously with the church. 
is in Matthew 16, 18, and 19. And in view of Matthew's emphasis on the kingdom, it's exceedingly difficult to understand how the theory that asserts that the kingdom was postponed and is yet in the future could have ever come about. Premillennialists believe that the kingdom is yet future and the church was just instituted as a contingency because of the rejection of Christ by the Jews until such time as the kingdom will be set up by the Lord at the second coming of Christ. What's wrong with that? Yeah, it's false. The kingdom of Christ has come. It came when? The day of Pentecost when the church came. Now there are several senses in which the word kingdom is used. Look at Matthew 8, 10 through 12 and you'll see a two-fold use of the kingdom in just those two verses. Matthew 8, 10. Someone read Matthew 8, 10 through 12. Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out in the outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay. Now obviously Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are not members of the Lord's church. But many are going to sit down with them where? In the kingdom of heaven. What's that referring to? That's heaven. The eternal phase of the kingdom. Or the church in heaven. The faithful patriarchs of old will be among the faithful in heaven. Hebrews 11.40 God having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. In the judgment parable of uh, Matthew 25, 34, then shall the king say unto them on the right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. What's that speaking of? Heaven. That's speaking of heaven. At the second coming, the kingdom or church will be delivered up to God, 1 Corinthians 15, 24. At that time, it will enter its eternal or heavenly phrase. But back in Matthew 8, 12, Jesus speaks of the children of the kingdom being cast out into outer darkness. Who's that? Well, that's the unfaithful Jews. So you got two different references to two different things within the two verses. You see that? That's the unfaithful Jews being rejected. The point of the passage is that if the children of the kingdom would have had the faith of, of the Gentile centurion in that context, they could have been saved too. And those Gentiles that displayed that faith would sit down in the kingdom of heaven with whom? Abraham. Abraham. Isaac and Jacob, but many of the Jews would not. Well, with that said, most of the time the word kingdom is used in the New Testament. It's used synonymously with the church. Sometimes it's called the kingdom of God. It's so called because the kingdom is from God. It belongs to God. And even Christ's reign over it is in harmony with the will of the Father and in subjection to Him. 1 Corinthians 15, 27. It's also called the kingdom of heaven. Interestingly, that term is found only in the book of Mark. I'm sorry, wrong. The book of Matthew. He uses it 31 times. Now, it can easily be seen that the kingdom of heaven is the same thing as the kingdom of God. And I point out there are those that try to make a distinction between the two. In fact, the Schofield Reference Bible tries to make that distinction. 
So keep in mind these verses that I've got on the chart. Uh, Matthew 13, 31. The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed. Mark 4, 30. See how I've got them connected with a line? Mark 4, 30. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. Matthew 13, 33, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman hid in, in meal. Luke 13, 20, the kingdom of God is like leaven hid in meal. Matthew 13, 11, it's given to the disciples to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Luke 8, 9, they're given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. So these, these references, these couplets are are important because they reveal these two terms refer to what? The same, thing. the same thing. It's called the kingdom of heaven because heaven's where the kingdom and its principles originated. Also, Matthew 16, 18, and 19. I don't have that on the chart. Matthew 16, 18, and 19. Jesus says, upon this rock I will build my church. The gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The church of Christ and the kingdom of heaven are used synonymously and interchangeably in those verses. The Lord promised to build his church and to give to Peter and the rest of the apostles what? Keys. Keys signifying terms of admission into the kingdom. Well, if the church and the kingdom are not the same, then Peter and the apostles would have no right to use the keys of the kingdom on the church. And if the kingdom has not yet been established, as some falsely teach, then Peter and the apostles never had the privilege of using the keys. Well, why give them to them in the first place? I was with a friend of mine the other day. He may be listening today. He's from up in Illinois, and he was saying that his father gave him the keys to the family car. He didn't have his own car. He was allowed to drive the family car, but the day that his daddy gave him the keys, he said, if you ever get a speeding ticket, I'm taking the keys back, and you'll never have them again. And guess what? He has never had a speeding ticket in his life. <laughs> well, why give him the keys if he couldn't drive the car? When were the keys used? For the first time. On the day of Pentecost. 3,000 souls were added to the church or kingdom. Acts 2.47. In the parable of the sower, Jesus spoke of the seed being the word of God. Luke 8 and verse 11. Yet in Matthew 19, uh, 13, 19 is referred to as the word of the kingdom. So the word of God is the seed of the kingdom and everywhere in the New Testament that the seed was planted, the establishment of the church resulted. Do you catch that? When the seed of the kingdom was planted, what came up? The church. The one seed produced the church or kingdom. The seed of the kingdom produced members of the church as well as citizens of the kingdom. I tell you, brethren, you think this is simple. There's a lot of fuzzy thinking on this among brethren. Well-educated brethren. Bugs me to no end. If the church and the kingdom are not the same, then you've got one seed producing two different kinds of plants. That's contrary to both nature and revelation. Okay, next chart. 
Do these kingdom parables apply to us today? You need to be aware that there are those today who are teaching that the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are part of the Old Testament. Surprise. And are not a part of the New Testament. And they claim that all of the words of Jesus are just explanations of the law of Moses or prophecies of the church and that nothing is binding upon the Christian today except the material from Acts 2 to Revelation 22. You ever heard that? And do you know why they teach that? Yeah, they're trying to get away from what passage? Exactly. Matthew 19.9. That is a radical uh, misunderstanding of the church in preparation. Mark 1.1. 1, 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now note he didn't say the conclusion or the ending of the law of Moses. That book's not the ending, it's the beginning. Mark's words indicate the beginning of the church in preparation by the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom at hand by John and by Jesus. Mark 1.14, now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. <clears throat> Repent ye and believe the gospel. See, this was new. This was the beginning of this type of preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. Luke 16, 16. Jesus said, The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. This is the beginning of the preaching of the kingdom of God. Men were beginning to seek it. The law and the prophets, that's the Old Testament scriptures. But since that time, when John the Baptist came, the kingdom of God began to be preached. First by John, then Jesus, later by the apostles and others. That was all preparatory work that was needed. They spoke concerning the things that would come into effect in the Christian age when the church or the kingdom would begin. Jesus pointed to the establishment of the kingdom. Like John, he preached, Time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Mark 1, 15. Under what law did Jesus live? Under the law of Moses. Did he recognize the authority of Moses? Did he teach others to obey that law? Sure. But, he taught the principles of the new kingdom soon to be established so that his disciples and apostles would be prepared for it when he came. But there were principles which they couldn't bear then. That's John 16, 12 through 13. He said, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. These principles were so different from the law of Moses that they could not be practiced until after the death of Christ and the establishment of his kingdom. And so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John contained things which would become part of the teaching of the church. And one of the things that we need to emphasize, friends, is that law can be stated before it comes into effect. Right? Yes, sir. Let me give you some examples. John 3, 5. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into what? The kingdom, the kingdom of God. That passage reveals how to enter the kingdom. Well, has the kingdom come yet? No. no. But while the Lord lived, he taught and exemplified 
principles and teachings that would find their application when the kingdom came. Congress can enact laws which do not become effective until a later date. And that's what Jesus did. Here's another illustration. Matthew 18, someone read that. Matthew 18, 15 through 17. Somebody that has not read today. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if, and if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Now, if you ever run into this false doctrine I'm discussing, you need to remember this scripture. Because it forever shows the error of the theory that all pre-Pentecost teaching is part of the Old Testament. When was this instruction to be applied? Is it to be applied during Judaism? Is it to be applied during the time of John the Baptist? Is it to be, to be applied when we get to heaven? No. When is it to be applied? In the church. In the church. The church would have to be in existence for this to be carried out. So it's clear it applies to us now. As members of the church or else it doesn't have any application whatsoever. But if it's admitted that it has application now, then you've established, well, the Lord taught something during his personal ministry that did not apply then, but which does apply now. And is that repeated after Pentecost? Yes. Amen. No. No. This doctrine I'm talking about teaches that if it's not mentioned after Pentecost, it's not binding on the church. Does the golden rule apply today? Yes. Matthew 7, 12. Does any of the Sermon on the Mount apply to the church? Yes. Yes. Of course. All right. Now, with these things in mind, could that be me? It's gone, so it wasn't me. All right, with these things in mind now, I'm ready to ask the question. Do the kingdom parables of Christ and the gospel accounts apply to us today? Yes. yes. Certainly so. Each of these contain revelation hidden from some and revealed to others concerning the future kingdom of Christ, which has now arrived. In one chapter in particular, Matthew chapter 13 stands out because it contains seven kingdom parables more than any other chapter in the gospel accounts. The parable of the sower doesn't say the kingdom of heaven is like, but each of the remaining parables does. And most of them are short and they provide simple points of understanding. Going back to that chart, the parable of the sower teaches attitudes toward the kingdom. Parable of the tares teaches of evil in the kingdom. Parable of the mustard seed teaches of the growth of the kingdom. Parable of the leaven teaches of the influence of the kingdom. Parable of the hidden treasure teaches the value of the kingdom. Parable of the pearl of great price teaches the value of seeking the kingdom. Parable of the dragnet teaches the coming separation in the kingdom. Parable of the labors in the vineyard teaches the importance of service rather than seniority in the kingdom. Parable of the two sons teaches the need for repentance and obedience to enter the kingdom. Parable of the wicked husbandman teaches the rejection of Jesus by the Jews, how they would be replaced as God's special people. Parable of the great supper teaches the prominence of Gentiles in the kingdom. And then finally, the parable of the secret seed teaches the unfolding nature of the kingdom. All right. Are you glad I went ahead and did that? Okay, let's take our break, and then we start when we come back with the parable of the sower.
You ever heard that doctrine before? Anybody ever heard that doctrine before? Raise your hand if you heard that doctrine. Some have, some haven't. Kind of a mix. You're liable to run into it. They'll claim that the dividing page instead of in front of Matthew ought to be in front of Acts. <coughs> Parable of the sower. Be turning to Luke 8, 4 through 15. Here we go. This parable is also called by another name. What would that be? Parable of the soils. Parable of the soils. Because that's what it deals with primarily. However, what did Jesus call it? Matthew 13, 18, Matthew's account, he said, Hear ye the parable of the sower. So he called it the sower. Sure, he goes into detail about the soils, but why does he do that? To help the sower. Now, all of you need to know and understand this parable above all others. Why? Because it deals with us. It's directed to you, the teacher. It's the parable of the teacher, of the preacher, of the parent, of the personal worker, and of everybody else who endeavors to plant seeds of truth in the hearts of men. He gave this to give us a better understanding of our work. And when you consider how much teaching and preaching goes on in a year, you may wonder why there is such a small harvest. The fault does not lie with the faithful sower or the powerful seed. The problem is often with what? Soil. The soil. Now, do we have any farmers in here? Any farmers in here? Joey. Maybe one. Farmers are familiar with soil samples. The soil of a farmer may be analyzed. And one can determine if there's something like acidity in excess or if there's some kind of chemical that is, uh, that is lacking. This parable is a kind of spiritual soil sample for the sower. Analyzing the different types of soil enables us to be better sowers and to understand our business a little better. If the fruit is not forthcoming, it's Probably something wrong with the soul. Um, in Luke 4, 28, And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him into the brow of the hill whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he passing through the midst of them went his way, and he came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. So after one of his lessons, they tried to kill the Lord. 
Was there something wrong with his sowing? No. Was he the perfect sower? Yes. So that wasn't the Lord's fault. That wasn't the fault of his teaching. The fault lied where? Yeah, those, those that heard him. So Jesus explains that to us in this parable. And in just a few words, he speaks volumes concerning the heart of every individual that, that lives or has ever lived. Four different types of soil. The wayside or hard soil. First of all, Luke 8, 5. Someone read Luke 8, 5. The sower went forth to sow seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden underfoot, and the birds of the, of the heaven devoured it. So what's the problem with the soil? It's too hard. It's too hard. The seed can't penetrate, can't germinate. And so what happens to the seed? Here come the birds, and they devour it. There is no receiving of God's word. The wayside was the path through the common field separating the plots. In Palestine, there were no fences or walls to separate the plots. Only these narrow paths that were traveled by everybody. What does foot traffic do to soil? It hardens it. Now someone read verse 12. Those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Many hearers are like hard wayside soul. Their hearts are hardened against the truth. They don't understand it. They never allow the word to get under the surface of their thoughts. They're hard and indifferent to the seed. And so, who comes along? Then cometh the devil. I have a sermon by that title. Then cometh the the devil. He's, he can pick the seed right up off the surface because it never sunk into the ground and took root. The devil knows the power of God's word. True or false? Yes, sir. That's true. He wants to get the word out of the hearts of men because he knows God's word has the power to produce an obedient saving faith and we often say when there's a preacher in the pulpit there's a devil in the pews you know somebody who attends regularly and hear God's word but doesn't obey it a devil is working with that person Hebrews 3.13 exhort one another while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. The human heart can be hardened like pavement by persisting in wrong and rejecting the right. It can be sermon hardened as well as sin hardened. Procrastination in obeying God's will can harden the heart. You can get so in the habit of of hearing the truth presented to you and then rejecting that, that your heart becomes hardened and the seed just just rattles off the surface like, like rain on a rock. So no receiving of God's word. Now we have the shallow or rocky soul. Verse 6. Luke 8, 6. Someone? And some fell upon the rock, and as soon as it sprung up, it withered away, because it lacked moisture. In many parts of Palestine, you find a substratum of limestone, 
that's covered with a top, uh, with a thin layer of topsoil. So the shoot can grow up, but the roots cannot go down. And then the sun withers the plant. No roots for the word. Verse 13. And those on the rock are they who, when they have heard, receive the word with joy. And though these have no root, for who for a while believe and in time of temptation fall away. There were many people that followed Jesus impulsively. And at times they would just run over him in order to get to him. What's wrong with them? It's not that they accepted Jesus too quickly. It's not that they were too enthusiastic. The trouble was their faith was shallow. It was thin. Like that thin layer of soil over a bed of rock. And then when persecution came, they gave it all up. They did not count the cost. There are a lot of people like that today. You know people obey the gospel during the gospel meeting. And then after that their interest wanes. And they fail to continue in the faith. Their faith rests on emotion. And not conviction. As long as the emotion of the gospel meeting lasts. That's just how long their faith lasts. They don't have any root. No roots. Alright notice three things. You get the three by comparing Matthew's account and Luke's account. Three things that cause people to become unfaithful. Number one, tribulation or trouble. Matthew 13, 21, Yet hath he no root in himself, but dureth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. Does becoming a child of God deliver you from trouble? Yes, sir. No. no. Might bring you trouble. Yeah. Peter said, If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this behalf or in this name. 1 Peter 4.16 Some of these TV preachers, not myself, <laughs> say... Uh, get saved and God will solve all your problems. Whether we're talking about health or wealth or, or family. Is that the gospel? That's not the gospel. And even some brethren, when they lose a job or lose a loved one, lose their health, they think God does not love them anymore. And quit serving him. We got to hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of our hope firm unto the end. Hebrews three six. Next, you have temptation. Luke eight thirteen. They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. Does salvation deliver us from temptation? Yes, sir. No. The, the fact that you receive God's word with joy in no way means that Satan is going to leave you alone. That he's going to cease trying to control your life and your destiny. In fact, he may be intensifying his temptations. Third, persecution. Yet hath he not rooted himself but dure for the while for when temptation, I'm sorry, when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he's offended. So the persecution may come as social rejection by family or friends. It may come as verbal abuse from former friends who don't understand that people can really be changed by the power of God. First Peter 4.4 4. Wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of right, speaking evil of you. Some husbands have made life miserable for a wife who became a Christian. 
And some wives have done the same for husbands who obeyed the gospel. So here are three things among those things that can cause a person to fall away. Tribulation, temptation, persecution. But they're actually symptoms of the real problem. What's the real problem? No roots. No roots. Ephesians 3.17 That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in love. Colossians 1.23 If you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Colossians 2.17 Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. Now if our faith is built on strong convictions, then trouble and temptations and persecutions will not cause us to wither and die. Sun is good for plants if they have roots. And these three things can make the rooted Christian stronger, but they will expose the shallowness of the stony ground here. Third, you have the crowded or thorny soil. Since the devil does not want people to hear the gospel and be saved, he's delighted if he can keep the seed from being sown. But if the seed is sown, he doesn't give up. He snatches the seed from wayside hearts. If the seed sprouts, he still does not accept defeat because he knows some can be turned away from Christ by tribulation or by temptation or persecution. If those don't succeed, the devil tries something else because he realizes there are hearts with depths of soul that nevertheless can have the word crowded out by different things. You know, if the devil wins, he doesn't care how he does it. Verse 7, And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. So no, no receiving of God's word, no roots for God's word, and now no room. No room for God's word. There's enough soil so that the roots can go down, but there's not enough room for the plant to grow up and produce fruit. The plant is crowded out, and the fruit is choked. Verse 14, And that which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit to perfection. So what are the thorns, the cares of this world, and, and some of those there were so poor beyond what most people are in, in this country. They were worried about their daily bread and from where it was coming. Next, the deceitfulness of riches. Do you have to be rich to have a bad attitude toward money? Can the poor also? Yes. yes. And thus crowd out the word. And while riches promise satisfaction, can they promise it? Can they furnish it? Lasting satisfaction. Ecclesiastes 5.10, Solomon says, He that loveth silver should not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also... Vanity. They cannot buy security on Judgment Day. To the rich farmer in Luke twelve twenty, God said unto him, Thou fool, this night shall thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall these things be that thou hast provided? Where must we put our trust? In riches? No, in God. Jesus said, children, 
How hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? Mark 10, 24. Third, the pleasures of life. 2 Timothy 3, 4. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Some pleasures are good within themselves and within moderation. Uh, gardening, for example. Is that a good hobby? Yes. Whether it's flower gardening or vegetable gardening, that's a good hobby. But that can become a thorn if you let it. A thorn is anything that crowds Jesus out of our lives and chokes the word out of our hearts. And many people are being choked to death. We're so busy, our lives are so cumbered by this and that, until the good is smothered out. Thorns can be weeded out, and that's what Christ demands of us, that his cause might have first priority in our lives. And then finally, you have the good soul. He closes with a, a powerful note. As a sower, you meet discouragements. You meet disappointments. But you can be encouraged by the fact that there is still some good ground. And isn't it wonderful that good ground is still around? Now, again, when we look at the three parallel accounts, we see a good explanation of good soul. Number one, the good soul understands the word. Matthew 13, 23. He hears and obeys. Number two, the good soul receives the word. Mark 4, 20. He takes it in. It becomes part of him. James 1, 21. And then third, the good soul keeps the word. Luke 8, 15, he holds on to it, he practices it in his life. And with patience, fruit is produced and the seed has brought forth yet another sower who scatters the seed. I believe that this parable may have been especially designed to prevent or to remove false conceptions which the sower may have of his work and of its results. That it may be designed to motivate us as sowers to be faithful in spite of the fact that our work at sometimes may seem futile and unfruitful. Okay, that's the parable of the sower. Now we go to the parable of the tares. I want to alert you to the fact that you can read a full chapter that I wrote on this parable for Brother Clark in the 2000 Power Lectures on the Parables of Jesus. If any of you went to the Power Lectures and you got the thumb drive or the CD that's got all of their lectureship books on it, didn't get that well if you do it would have it on there the books are probably still available It'd be a good book for you to have but that's the that's the 2000 power lectures on the parables of Jesus I'm thankful that Jesus took the time to explain this parable and the parable of the sower this parable is one of the kingdom parables and it reveals the work of the Son of God through the saints of God in sowing the seed of the kingdom. Those that have received the seed are called the sons of the kingdom. We also see the devil sowing his seed and the children of the wicked one that are produced by it. The kingdom of heaven would be exposed to trials. It would face obstacles in the world and yet God would ultimately right all wrongs in the eventual separation of the servants of the Savior 
and the servants of Satan to receive their reward and or punishment. Okay, so here's my outline. The speaking of the parable, 24 through 30. The sowers of the seed, 37 and 39. The seed that was sown, 38. The setting for the sowing, 38. The separation of the saints and the sinners, 39 and 41. The suffering of the sinners, 42. And the shining of the saints, verse 43. And that is found in the book. Someone read Matthew 13, 24 through 30. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which soweth good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servant of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto him, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest ye gather up the tares, ye root up the wheat also with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of the harvest I will save the reapers. Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. The parables of Jesus are of events which either did happen or could have happened, and in this parable... The owner of the field had an enemy who under the cover of darkness sowed tares in the field in which the wheat had been sown. Smith's Bible Dictionary says this concerning tares. A noxious plant of the grass family supposed to mean the darnel. It grows among the wheat everywhere in Palestine and bears a great resemblance to it while growing so closely that before they head out the two plants can hardly be distinguished. The grains are found, two or three together, in twelve small husks, scattered on a rather long head. The Arabs do not separate the darnel from the wheat, unless by means of a fan or sieve after threshing. There have been occasions when an enemy has sown another, another's field with uh, bad seed, and there's a story that I got from the late Brother Jay McNutt, who was one of my teachers here, that I have used to illustrate the truth that we reap what we sow. But it also reveals what people will do if they have a lot of malice in the heart. So there's some boys that were continually crossing a field. And the farmer decided to stop them by erecting a no trespassing sign on his land. And this made one of the boys so angry that he vowed that he would get even with the farmer. So he went to the feed store and he bought a supply of Johnson grass seed. And he sowed every field fully. Well, as the story goes, Later on, he fell in love with, guess who? The farmer's daughter. And they were married. And when the old man died, he inherited the farm. And he spent the rest of his life fighting Johnson Grass. That illustrates the lingering effect of, of evil actions. The sowers of the seed, next. They're identified by Jesus, 37. He answered and said to them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. So the householder on the field and sowed the seed is whom? Christ. But there's a further application there we must not miss. He says in verse 24, the kingdom of heaven, always watch this, friends. The kingdom of heaven is likened to what? A man 
which sowed good seed in his field. See, the kingdom or church in this parable is not likened to the field. You see that? It's not likened to the enemy, but to the man who sowed the good seed. In other words, the kingdom does what the sower's doing. It sows the good seed. The Son of Man sows the good seed in his field today through you and me, through his servants. And as Christians, we're obligated to use our time and our efforts and our financial resources in the, bu in the business of sowing the seed of the kingdom. Now, he also identifies the enemy that sowed the tares. Matthew 13, 39, the enemy that sowed them is the devil. So we have him identified. And, you know, you have to ask, are we as zealous for our work as the devil is for his? I love to tell the story about the woman who had the reputation of always being able to say something good about everybody no matter how worthless a person might be. And so uh, there were some young men who wanted to get the best of Granny, and they asked her this question. They said, Granny, can you say anything good about the devil? And they thought they had her, and Granny thought about it a while, and she hesitated, and then she replied, well, there's one good thing I can say about the devil. He's always on the job. That's true, isn't it? He is persistent. Whenever there's a child of God sowing the word of God, Jesus says there's also a devil sowing his tares. And his persistence pays off in too many places that we've neglected. Third, you have the seed that was sown. 38, Jesus identifies that by saying, the good seed are the children of the kingdom. These are those that have been begotten by the word of God, James 1.18. And Matthew 13.19 speaks of the word of the kingdom. Well, what does the word of the kingdom produce? children of the kingdom and they in turn produce fruit to the glory of God sowing the seed of the kingdom will that produce a religious denomination will that produce members of such so their presence in the field of the world points to the fact somebody has been sowing something other than the seed of the kingdom right Jesus says the tares are the children of the wicked one, Matthew 13, 38. So they're the product of the sowing of the devil. They persist in their wrongdoing. Now these children can resemble the children of the kingdom, just as tares can resemble wheat. Now, years ago, there was a TV series called The Great Pretender. And the idea of that series came from a man who actually lived. His name was Ferdinand Waldo de Mera, Jr. And he was called the Great Imposter. And probably better than the TV series is a similar movie that starred uh, Tony Curtis as uh, Ferdinand de Mera. I've seen that. They don't show it very much. It's been a long time since I've seen it. But it is similar to a movie that came out in 2002 called Catch Me If You Can. Anybody familiar with that? Tom Hanks and uh, a young Leonardo DiCaprio. That's also based on a true story. Very similar plot line. That's about a man, uh, Tom Abinale Jr., who was a forger. Um, but anyway, Mr. DeMera 
from the first movie in the TV show. He was a high school dropout. And without any credentials, he served at various times as a university executive, psychology professor, Trappist monk, assistant warden of a Texas prison, and a Canadian Navy surgeon in Korea. And as a surgeon, he did tonsillectomies, amputated limbs, and even removed a bullet from a man's chest. And yet the only medical knowledge that he had was what he read in books. This is true. For a while, he was a teacher in high school. And many people thought he was the best teacher there. Well, how did he find employment in all of those roles? He would falsify evidence. He would forge identity papers. He would just fake his way through anything necessary to confirm that he was somebody that he wasn't. The great imposter. Second Timothy 3.13, the American Standard says, evil men and American Standard says, and imposters shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Jesus warned about false prophets coming in what kind of clothing? Sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Matthew 7, 15. So the Lord's parable of the wheat and the tares should serve as a reminder that Satan specializes in Planting counterfeit Christians among the, among the true. The closer the counterfeit is to the true, the harder it is to spot and reject. The devil has a lot of people in pulpits parading under the guise of righteousness when their real design is to lead people away from the truth. Sometimes we're eager to embrace any teacher who claims to be a Christian. And as a consequence, some congregations invite in teachers who claim to be teaching the truth, but in actuality are teaching error. So we have to be on guard against the imposters who sneak in unawares. You remember what Paul told the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, 29. I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Next you have the setting for the sowing, verse 38. Again, very important. The field is what? The field is... No, no, no. Matthew 13, 38. The field is the world. The world. Nevertheless, you have people that insist on drawing the conclusion that the field is the church. I don't see how you can come to that conclusion. It reminds me of the man who gave a report on some uh, experiments that he had made and he claimed he had been able to train a flea to follow spoken commands. You ever heard this? He said, I told it to jump, and it did. And then I pulled off one leg, and I told it to jump, and it did. I pulled off a second leg, and then a third leg. And each time when I gave the command to jump, it responded. But he said a strange thing happened. When I pulled off that last leg, I gave the command for it to jump, and it just sat there. He said I was able to infer from that that when a flea loses all of its legs, it becomes deaf. <laughs> That's a faulty conclusion, isn't it? Well, a lot of people reach a faulty conclusion on, on Matthew 13, 
38 on the meaning of the field. So they say that that's the church. And you have the good and the evil continuing to gather until the judgment. And then they try to teach that the church has no authority to withdraw fellowship from people. Well, that's false for several reasons. First of all, and I've been stressing it to you, Jesus said the field is what? The world. Is the world. Number two, church discipline is clearly taught in the Bible. Matthew 18, 7, 2 Timothy 3, 5, Titus 3, 10. And our interpretation of a parable must not contradict other plain passages. And then the, the motive of the servants was not to disfellowship the tares, but to destroy them. We disfellowship out of Christian love in order that one might come to their senses and be saved. Not to destroy them. Well, we need to move on. Separation of the saints and the sinners. Someone read Matthew thirteen thirty-nine through 41. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tears are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them that do iniquity. The harvest is the end of the world, and this parable teaches the separation of all mankind at the end of the world. The Greek phrase utilized there can mean end of the age, and those that hold the AD 70 theory believe that refers to the fall of Jerusalem. But the phrase end of the world also occurs in Matthew 28 20. And McGarvey said the term rendered world frequently means age. But he said, whether we render it world or age in this place, the meaning is the same, for the age referred to must be the Christian age, and this will end with the world itself. Did the separation of saints and sinners occur in A.D. 70? No. God is yet to send out his angels. And believe me, we'll know when he does, right? We'll know when he does. But at the end of the world, the soil will end, the harvest will take place, the sower will will then be the judge. Uh, what does that do with the doctrine of universalism? Is God's grace going to unconditionally make wheat out of tares? No. no. What does it do to Calvinistic uh, unconditional election doctrine? Yeah. If God gives his grace unconditionally, to a select number, that'd be the wheat, then on what basis does God decide those who become the recipients of his grace? Did he from eternity choose those who would be the wheat and foreordain the others that would be the tares? No. Uh, let's move on. Suffering of the saints, verse 42. He says, his reapers and the angels would cast the children of the wicked one into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. One Gallup poll revealed that 77% of all Americans believe there's a heaven. Yet only 58% believe in hell. It's hard to read this parable and, and still say there's no such thing as hell, right? He spoke of the furnace of fire. Well, I've got to move on with three minutes. The shining of the saints, verse 43. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. The wheat are the righteous. They've obeyed the gospel. God's declared them righteous. They do right in his sight. 
The sons of the kingdom will one day shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. We've been called into his eternal glory. 1 Peter 5 and verse 10. And our eternal reward is not given at the point of death, but at the second coming of Christ. When Jesus comes to take us back with him. That's John 14, 3. And the word then, there in Matthew 13, 43, refers to the time just after the harvest at the end of the world. And at that time, what will happen to the kingdom? Delivered up to the Father. And in its heavenly state, nothing that defileth shall enter into it. Revelation 21, 27. It will shine forth like golden wheat swaying in the field. And the expression, into my barn, symbolizes the safekeeping of God. Daniel 12, 3, Daniel said, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So this picture is the kingdom of Christ within the kingdom of this evil world. A day of harvest and separation is coming and only in the harvest time will we truly be able to know how much eternal good we have done. I close with this poem by Brother C.R. Brewer who was one more poet. Who sowed the seed? None could recall but somewhere in the bygone years, a toiler in the ground let fall, a seed that in the soil took hold. And three long months of heat and cold increased and spread, till now appears an annual harvest of rich gold. Who planted the tree? Nobody knew. But someone sometimes set it out, and it through rain and sunshine grew, although no eye was near to see till from the little tender sprout there came a sheltering giant tree, and many a pilgrim breathed a prayer of thanks for him who put it there. Who sowed good seed? Perhaps not now, but in eternity we'll know. The master then will tell us how some gentle soul, devoid of fame, proclaimed a truth in his great name, showed someone else the way to go. And then another, seeing the light, turned from the way of doubt and wrong, and followed the pathway of the right. And thus the good work moved along. But only in heaven will it be known by whom the original seed was sown. Let's go to lunch.
Okay. Parable of the mustard seed. Mark 4, 30 through 34. I said 33, but this is one of the shortest of the parables. The main thrust of this parable is the growth of the early church. It speaks of the great effect that the kingdom of God would have in the world. And it shows that the kingdom of Christ, or church of Christ, is the mustard seed kingdom. Why is such the case? Three reasons. Due to its early insignificance, due to its divine vitality, due to its incredible growth. First of all, due to its early insignificance. Mark 4.30. Someone read verses 30 through 31. Mark 4. <clears throat> And he said, How shall we liken the kingdom of God, or in what parable shall we set it forth? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which, when it is sown upon the earth, though it be less than all the seeds that are upon the earth. Of all the seeds ordinarily planted in the, in the ancient gardens of Palestine, the mustard seed was the smallest. It was so small that it was a proverb in the land of Palestine, as small as a grain of mustard seed. And Jesus referenced it in Matthew 17, 20. If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. So this was an expression used to indicate anything that was very insignificant. And yet the mustard seed was very valuable in what it produced from a very small beginning. Often we underestimate the importance of little things. Have you ever heard the parable of the horseshoe nail? Evidently not. Well, it goes like this. For want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For want of a shoe, the horse was lost. For want of a horse, the rider was lost. For want of a rider, the battle was lost. For want of a battle, the kingdom was lost. And all for the want of a horseshoe nail. Little things often caught the attention of Jesus and caused comments like the fall of a sparrow, the cry of need in a noisy crowd, and in this parable of the growth of a seed, a cup of cold water given in his name wins his praise. The widow's mites did not go unnoticed. No man has the right approach to God until he understands the importance of small things. And as the mustard seed is a very small seed, so the church of the Lord had a very small beginning, but grew remarkably therefrom. Kingdoms of men often have proud beginnings, but miserable ends. What about the Tower of Babel? What about the kingdoms of Babylon and Media and Persia and Greece and Rome. But the Lord's, in contrast, had a small beginning with a gradual increase and, of course, with a glorious end to be realized in the future. From the human point of view, the origin of his kingdom was small and insignificant. History's greatest movement had its beginning in a manger in Bethlehem. In Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 2, Isaiah spoke of the Lord as a root, a tender root 
out of the dry ground. Herod tried to kill the Lord. He was reared in the despised town of Nazareth. He had no rabbinical training. The Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? John seven fifteen. He had no wealth. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. Luke 9, 58. Jesus said, Foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man have not where to lay his head. He had little of his own. He used a borrowed manger, Boat, loaves and fishes, donkey, upper room, winding sheet, and tomb. He had no political fame. He was unjustly condemned and died a painful death on the cross. And to the world, his prospects for establishing a kingdom were mighty slim. Who were the men who went forth under the Lord's great commission? They were not men of wealth. For the most part, they were publicans and fishermen and unlearned and ignorant men. But they went forth and overturned giant systems opposed to the Lord kingdom. We must not despise the day of small things. That's Zechariah 4 and 10. The kingdom of Christ was like the mustard seed due to its early insignificance. Number two, due to its divine vitality. Mark 4.32, Jesus said that when the mustard seed is sown, it groweth up. Well, the kingdom has that same divine vitality or life. Our Lord knew the kingdom would succeed because life is where? It's in the seed. In the seed, the life of, of anything depends on its ability to reproduce. The mustard seed has the power to push away through the crust of the earth and to become a plant. And Jesus said the seed is the word of God, Luke 8, 11. Paul tells us the gospel is God's power unto salvation, Romans 1, 16. And our Lord, knowing the power there is in the seed, expected the kingdom to grow. Well, what happens if the pure seed of the gospel is sown today? It'll yield the same crop. You know, there are, there are people that tell us that it's necessary to rattle an unbroken chain of succession, church succession, from the apostles until today to have the same church as they did then. Is that necessary? That's not necessary. It's not necessary for seed to be planted every year in order to maintain its original stock. Some years ago, some wheat seed was found in the pyramids of Egypt. It had been hidden there for over 3,000 years without being exposed to any of the decaying forces of nature. And that same wheat was brought to our country and planted. What happened? Produced the same kind of wheat. Peter talks about the incorruptible seed which lives and abides forever in 1 Peter 1, 23. And when we receive the word of God in our hearts, it will do for us what it did for those in the First century. The kingdom of Christ is like the mustard seed due to its divine vitality. Third, due to its incredible growth. Verse 32, but when it is sown, it groweth up and becometh greater than all herbs and shooteth out great branches so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. The mustard seed has a small beginning, but it has a great increase. It was not unusual for it to grow 10 or 12 feet. The kingdom of Christ grew incredibly 
from a small beginning. That's in keeping with Daniel's interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream about the kingdom in Daniel 2.34 and also the prophecy of Isaiah 2, 2 and 3. That growth is verified in the history of the church. We know they're very successful because they turned the world upside down, Acts 17 and verse 6. Those people that stoned Stephen to death thought they were putting an end to Christianity. But instead, the persecution turned the Jerusalem church into missionaries. Acts 8, 4. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. And country after country fell before them. Judea, Samaria, Phoenicia, Cyprus, Asia Minor, Macedonia, Greece, Babylon, Arab, Arabia, and Ethiopia. It's thrilling, isn't it, to read of the growth of the early church? In Acts 2.41, the number added is said to have been about 3,000 souls. Acts 4 and 4, we're told the number's grown to about 5,000. And Luke seems to have lost count of the number. By Acts 6, 1, he just says, the number of the disciples were multiplying. And he speaks of the multitude of disciples in Acts 6, 2, and then in Acts 16, 5, and so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. I'm going to give you some reasons why the church grew like the mustard seed. I'm just going to put them out there and proceed. Number one, they lived in the shadow of the cross. They lived in the shadow of the cross. You can take these and preach it. Preach it. Number two, they really cared about people's needs. They really cared about people's needs. Acts 4, 34, for example. Or Acts 16, 9 and 10. Number three, they did not tolerate sin. Acts 5, 1 through 11. For they were evangel evangelistically zealous. Evangelistically zealous, number four. Acts 5, 42, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. They went everywhere preaching the word, Acts 8, 4. Five, they had a membership genuinely converted to Christ Acts 2, 37 through 41. Six, they avidly practiced the fine art of praying. They avidly practiced the fine art of praying. Acts 2, 41 grew out of Acts 1, 14. These all continued in one accord with prayer and supplication. Again, the words of Acts 6, 7, the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, is immediately preceded by, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Acts 6, 4. These and many other factors contributed to the growth of the mustard seed kingdom. And when the roll is called up yonder, we can thank the Lord for the parable of the mustard seed. This parable assures us that the kingdom will go forward. And where would we be without it? God's way will win. Mustard seed kingdom. Now, parable of the leaven. Matthew thirteen thirty three. 
Someone read that. Matthew 13, 33. Another parable spake he unto them. The kingdom of heaven is likened unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, and me measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Another short parable, right? Now there are similarities between it and the parable of the mustard seed that I just gave. Because both parables emphasize growth and progress. Both stress the idea of small beginnings with great results to follow. Both are prophetic regarding the growth of the church. But there are some differences. The mustard seed underscores the fact of growth while the leaven gives emphasis to the way of growth. Mustard seed, the fact of growth. Leaven, the way of growth. Mustard seed parable looks on the growth of the church from the outward point of view. Leaven looks on the growth of the church from the inward point of view. Now, in order to understand the Lord's meaning of this parable, you have to have a knowledge of leaven. And that will help us to see the intent and the meaning of the Lord's words and the application to us. So, here's my outline. Number one, what is leaven? What is leaven? Bread. No. Yeast. 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 The word is used in the Hebrew language, which corresponds to our English word. It's found five times in the Old Testament. Four times it's rendered leaven, and in the fifth time it's rendered leavened bread. According to McClintock and Strong, leaven seems to have denoted originally the remnant of the dough left from the preceding baking, which had fermented and turned to acid. In ancient times, leaven as a separate ingredient was not available as it is today. Dough would be kept over from a previous baking and inserted into the new mixture. In Jesus' day, leaven was sourdough in a state of fermentation. When it was mixed into the dough, it would cause the bread to rise when it's baked, just like yeast does today. Sourdough, or natural leaven, refers to the process of leavening bread by capturing wild yeast in dough or batter, as opposed to using domestic, purpose-cultured yeast. Sourdough is no longer the standard method for bread leavening in most developed countries. It's been replaced by cultured yeast. However, some form of natural leaven is still used by many specialty bakeries today. And I, I love sourdough bread. You like sourdough bread? Yes, sir. Ooh, sourdough bread is good. And it's made by using a, a small amount of what they call starter dough. Have you ever heard that? Starter? And the starter dough contains the yeast culture. And then you mix that with new flour and water. And then part of the resulting dough is then saved and you use that as a starter for the next batch. And as long as that starter dough is fed flour and water daily, that sourdough mixture can stay in room temperature indefinitely and can remain healthy and usable. It's not uncommon for baker starter dough to have years of history from many hundreds of previous batches. And as a result of that, every bakery's sour dough has a distinctive taste. You might be interested, interested to know that the ancient 
Egyptian sourdough starter is the oldest starter known to man. It has a taste that is described as being sweet <clears throat> and yeasty. And it's the oldest one that we currently have on record. Scientists were able to pull off a <clears throat> Frankenstein kind of maneuver. They revived 4,500-year-old yeast microbes and they brought that into the light of the modern day. And that was done to understand gut bacteria in human beings. The famous tech developer, Seamus Blackley, any of y'all ever heard of him? I thought maybe you might have some gamers in here that might have heard of him. Because he is best known as the co-creator of the Xbox gaming console. Well, we have him to thank for being a, a prolific bread nerd <laughs> on top of being a physicist and a tech mastermind. When he came into possession of this ancient Egyptian yeast, he reached out to a team of scientists, a microbiologist and an archeologist and they were able to bring the strain uh, back to life. Sourdough bread became popular in this country during the California gold rush of the mid-1800s, and in the 1890s it was famous in the gold rush in Alaska. Prospectors would carry with them a small portion of sourdough mix that contained that natural yeast, and it could then be used as starter to make more of their favorite sourdough bread. So that's what yeast is. Number two, how was the word yeast used in Bible times? <clears throat> in the Old Testament, it was never used in a metaphorical or figurative sense. It was always used in a literal sense in the Old Testament. It was strictly forbidden in all offerings to the Lord by fire, Leviticus 2.11, and any offering to be consumed by the priest and not on the altar, leaven could be used. The showbread that was placed on the table in the holy place of the tabernacle was to be unleavened bread. That's Deuteronomy 16 and verse 3. Now, I remember when I was growing up that my sister would make these delicious homemade rolls. And she would put them in pans, and then she would cover them with plastic wrap. And she would set them outside on the banister of our carport. And they would rise in the sun. Anybody ever seen that? Yes? Yes? And let me tell you, the smell would get to me. And I would say, uh, are they ready yet? Are they ready to put in the oven? Are they ready to put in the oven? She said, no, no. You have to wait. You have to, you have to let them rise before you put them in the oven. Well, the... The Israelites, look at Deuteronomy 16.3. I didn't read that. Let's, let's, someone read that. Deuteronomy 16.3. Someone. Thou shalt eat no unleavened, no leavened bread with it. Seven days shalt thou eat unleavened bread therewith, even the bread of affliction. For thou comest forth out of the land of Egypt in haste, that thou mayest remember the day when thou comest forth out of the land of Egypt all the days of thy life. So those Israelites... Did they have to leave in a hurry? Did they have any time to wait for that bread to rise? No. And when the Lord instituted the Feast of Unleavened Bread, he even told them to remove all the leaven out of their houses because they customarily reserved a pinch of leavened dough from the previous day of baking and then they would knead that into the new batch. God said, can't do that. 
Can't do that. You've got to remove it all from your house. And those that didn't obey God's command to remove the leaven from their houses were to be cut off from their houses. That's the Old Testament. In the New Testament, leaven is used in the figurative sense with the exception of one place. The exception is when Jesus' disciples thought that he meant literal bread when he was referring to the figurative. It is figuratively used in an evil way to refer to corrupt doctrine and practices. In Matthew 16, 6, 1 Corinthians 15, 7 and 8, and Galatians 5 and 9. Because of this, there are differences as to how the parable of the leaven should be interpreted. Is this the only sense in which leaven is used in a good sense? Brother Franklin Kemp argued that since leaven is used in a bad sense in these other verses, that it ought to be seen in a bad sense here. So he thought it referred to apostasy. That when you allow corruption to enter in, unless it's corrected, it will leaven the whole thing. So he thought it was referring to a corrupting influence. And some other commentators agree with him. I have a difficulty, despite my love for Brother Camp, accepting that interpretation. And my friend and, and former instructor here, Tom Waycaster, does too. Brother Waycaster said, there are some who interpret this parable as prophetic of the apostasy of the church, likening the leaven into that which is evil. I reject this interpretation outright for the simple reason that it is not in keeping with what appears to be the purpose of these kingdom parables. And I agree with that. Why would Jesus say that the kingdom of God is like unto leaven if he was using leaven in an evil sense. You follow? Yes. So I think it's the case that uh, standing either for good or for bad, leaven was a figure for any strong and pervasive influence. And I think that's how Jesus is using the word in connection with the kingdom. That in this parable, the Lord speaks of leaven in a good sense. Just like a woman uses it for a good purpose to make wholesome, good bread. Brother Waycaster went on to say, The parable is prophetic, but it foretells of the growing influence of the church, not its corruption. It seems clear on the very surface that the woman in this parable represents the church, and the leaven is the word of God and its influence. The gospel, like leaven, works from within, rising silently and slowly, but growing nevertheless. And he then quoted from Pope, who wrote, Just as yeast is capable of working through an entire lump of dough to change its shape, consistency, and flavor, so too the gospel is a simple thing, capable of penetrating the heart and changing a disobedient soul into a faithful servant. The slow, mysterious action of God's word in the human heart is the most thrilling thing to observe when it begins to bring actual results in the life. Okay, now I have some applications. Number three, what are some qualities or characteristics of leaven? Number one, leaven does not grow in dough. It must be placed there. Again, Matthew 13, 33, another parable spake ye unto them. The kingdom of heaven is likened to leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leaven. So in order for the leaven to work, it must be placed there by hands. In order for the gospel of the kingdom of God to work in the hearts of men, it's got to be placed there by human agency. That's the Great Commission, Matthew 28. 19 through 20. The declining moral conditions of the present day ought to serve as a reminder 
of the type of influence that we need to be having. We've got to be taking the gospel into the world, Mark 16, 15. And in that way, we have a preserving, preventing, and saving influence. Yes, we need wisdom. Yes, we need tact and diplomacy and saving souls. But you know, it's possible for us to lay so much emphasis on tact that we never make any contact. The leaven had to make contact with the meal. You can live next door to a friend, sit across the aisle from someone else every Lord's Day, and associate with people in the business world constantly, and our acquaintances can die and be lost if we don't apply our knowledge and try to influence others for Jesus. 1 Corinthians 9.22 to the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Number two, leaven works inside dough from within to without. The woman hid it inside the meal to make it work. And so the gospel works within the hearts of men and women. Psalm 19.7. Psalm 119, 11, Thy word have I hid in mine heart. Romans 6.17 and 18. Obeyed from the heart. Three, leaven works quietly. The gospel is the converting power, Romans 1.16. It's the drawing power, John 6, 44 and 45. First Thessalonians 2, 13. As it is in truth the word of God that effectually worketh also in you that believe. For leaven works slowly. Sometimes it takes considerable time to influence and win a soul for Christ. We have to be patient toward all men. 1 Thessalonians 5.14 Never slam the door behind you. Leave it open for others to teach the word where you may not have succeeded. <clears throat> Fifth, leaven works persistently and unceasingly, though the majority is against it. Jesus said it worked till the whole was leavened. Jesus never quit. Hebrews 12, 2. Endured the cross, despising the shame. Paul never quit. 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. We should never quit. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Let's not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Galatians 6 and 9. Robert E. Perry's one great aim was to discover the North Pole and claim it for America. Seven times he tried. Seven times he failed. But on the eighth try, after 23 years of failures and being now 53 years old, he discovered it. We have to work persistently. Six, leaven multiplies and is contagious. The dramatic imagery of this parable is made even more striking by the amount of flour 
to which the woman adds the leaven. The three measures are one ephah that the woman uses in the parable amounts to half a bushel, more than 30 pounds of flour. That would make at least 40 large loaves of bread, sufficient to feed a few hundred people. And it's interesting to remember that Sarah baked that much bread when the three men visited at Mamre in Genesis 18.6. And this amount is also mentioned in Judges 6.19 and 1 Samuel 1.24. So the extraordinary imagery in the parable of the leaven was designed to leave the minds of the Jewish audience with the idea that there would be a superabundant yield in due time rather than immediately. The influence of the kingdom. This shows the hidden power of the church kingdom, that it would grow rapidly and affect the entire world. And we see that demonstrated throughout the book of Acts. It began small and mushroomed. Acts 2.41, Acts 19 and verse 20. Nothing can stop the growth of the kingdom of God. Yes. Um, sir, um, when you talk about um, the Christian influence and uh, uh, using Matthew 6, we talk about the salt, the light. And I'm trying to think about leaven, trying to see whether the Christian as a person and not, in this case, as the kingdom, uh, in, in, in collective sense, uh, will be classified as a leaven in his life as in how he influences others around him. Well, that's true, but in the parable, you have to look at what's the kingdom. The kingdom is like the leaven. So this is another growth parable of the kingdom, like the mustard seed. Rather than an illustration of the Christian's influence, like the salt and like the light. It's about influence, but it's about a different aspect of it. Okay? Okay. All right, let's see what we got. 51. Okay, with this one, we're combining two together. This is the only one I'm doing like this. But the parables of the hidden treasure and the pearl of great price. Have you ever found a treasure? That's an exciting thing. I could have brought my treasure today. I didn't think about that. I have something that I call my treasure. Uh, it sets up on the top shelf of my bookcases in my library. So high that I'm the only one just about that can reach it. It is a Civil War Bible complete Bible from the 1860s. And when one of our members died, who was one who liked to go to yard sales and buy things, and he was a big collector, and so they had a sale and we were going through things, and I was going through a filing cabinet, bottom drawer, back of the filing cabinet, in a card box and I found this Civil War Bible just priceless and the family allowed me to keep it so I call that my treasure finding hidden treasure is an exciting thing as a boy I like to read books like Treasure Island have you ever read Treasure Island mm -hmm. 
or um, the Count of Monte Cristo. Anybody ever read the Count of Monte Cristo? Oh, that's good. That's one of the most gripping stories ever written, I think. Tells of a certain prisoner named Edmund Dantes, and after a marvelous escape from imprisonment, he made his way to a cave on an island and found a tremendous treasure and from then on lived to be a very rich man. Well, that reminds me of these two parables that Jesus taught. The hidden treasure, the pearl of great price, they're both found in Matthew 13, 44 through 46. They're back to back. The parable, I'll make this distinction. The parable of the hidden treasure teaches the value of the kingdom teaches the value of the kingdom. Now, just a slight difference. The parable of the pearl of great price teaches the value of seeking the kingdom. The value of seeking the kingdom. Someone read Matthew 13, 44, please. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hidden in a field that which when a man hath found, he hideth and for joy thereof go, goeth and selleth all that he hath and buyeth that field. February of 2014. There was a Northern California couple that were walking their dog on their property and they spotted something beginning to emerge from the dirt of a pathway. It was a corroded tin can. They dug it up and then they began to find more cans and more cans. And they all contained gold coins more than 1,400 gold coins valued at more than $10 million. They had been minted at San Francisco at various times between 1847 and 1894 during the California gold rush era. There was one particularly rare coin in the collection that was valued at more than a million dollars, just that one coin. And that is believed to be the most valuable hidden treasure ever uncovered in the United States. Hiding treasure in a field was a lot more common in the Lord's day than it is today. We put our money in banks credit unions, in safety deposit boxes, in stocks, in bonds, in securities, in real estate. But at a time when banks were few and not trusted by all, it wasn't unusual for people to bury their possessions and then sometimes die, uh, leaving them all to be discovered by chance or else not be discovered. I mean, often they would just lie hidden for years and sometimes never would be found. They buried them out of fear, out of distrust, out of slowfulness. And uh, in one of the parables that Brother Bland will teach, the parable of the talents, what was it that the lazy steward did with his money? buried it in the ground rather than investing it or putting it to work for some profitable purpose. Well, the man in this parable immediately recognized the value of what he discovered. We're not told what the treasure was, just that it was very valuable. And he proceeded to go through a legal process to make it his own. He found the treasure, and then what did he do? He, he re-hid it. 
because of concern that somebody else might come across it just like he did. What's the next thing he did? He went out and sold all that he had to buy the field. Now, was it the field that he wanted? What did he really want? The treasure. The treasure. He wanted the treasure. Well, even though this man had not been looking for the treasure, when he found it by accident, he realized its value just as surely as he had been looking for it. Now, one question that's been raised, ooh. No, I'm not going to do that with a minute left. So we'll stop right there and take a break. No, I think they kept it.
How many people we have in here? Is everybody here today? Yes. Okay, we're done? Almost. It's got two hours left. Just lay them up there with you. That's fine. Just lay them up there with you. Okay. Let's go. One question that's been raised about this parable is, was the man unethical since he did not make known to the owner about the treasure? Well, Jesus does not give us every detail regarding the circumstances. Where was the owner of the treasure? Had he died? Had he forgotten where the treasure was? See, the Lord doesn't choose to tell us those details. Jewish rabbinic law said that when the object of value whose owner was unknown was found outdoors, the landowner had no necessary claim to it. Now we talked about Brother Woods this morning. Brother Woods thought that we might, quote, assume that the rightful owner was either dead or unknown and that the finder was entitled to what he had found. Seems to me that the treasure found in the field clearly did not belong to the landowner because uh, if it had been his, what would he have done before selling the field? Dug it up. Dug it up. So the fact that he didn't know it was there meant according to their law anyway, that he had no prior right to it. So by Jewish law, it belonged to the finder. Of course, it's also the case that Jesus would not have been commending the finder, the finder in any kind of questionable or dishonest conduct. He was commending him only in his earnest zeal in securing this treasure and his being willing to sacrifice everything else to obtain this wonderful treasure that he had found. Okay, now the parable of great, the pearl of great price. Uh, let's read someone who, who's somebody that hasn't read yet? Okay, you. Uh, 45 through 46, Matthew 13. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man seeking goodly pearls who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven... That's good. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so, in the previous parable, Jesus used some unspecified treasure to make his point. In this parable, he uses a specific kind of treasure. In the first parable... The kingdom is like the treasure. In this parable, the kingdom is like what? No. 
Ah, caught you, didn't I? That's the natural assumption. Difference, isn't it? Now, here's another difference. In the first parable, the treasure's found accidentally. In the second parable, the pearl of great price was sought after and found. Now, in this parable, there was a merchant. He was an expert on pearls. The word for merchant is emporios in the Greek text. It is the same word from whence we get our English word emporium. Emporium. And this man would travel from city to city, searching through markets and fishing ports and trade fairs, looking for high-grade pearls to buy for resale. People do the same thing today with antiques. They search through old barns and attics. They attend estate sales, just hoping to find an overlooked treasure that they can pick up at a bargain. Pearls are precious stones found where? Oysters. They are unique among gemstones because of their organic origin. They are the product of a living organism. The pearl oyster thrives in tropical waters at an average depth of 40 feet. A pearl is not a treasure that a man will just happen to stumble upon. In biblical times, they were obtained at great cost off the coast of Ceylon and the Persian Gulf. Divers operating from small boats dived into the dangerous reefs carrying a large stone that was attached to a rope to pull them down to the depths of the oyster beds. They risked attacks from sharks <coughs> from moray eels and from devilfish. Some were able to stay submerged for as much as about five minutes gathering the shellfish. But an average of only one oyster in a thousand contained a pearl. The divers were old men at 30 and generally did not survive the age of 40. No pearls were found in ancient times except at the risk of a man's life. A second extraordinary characteristic of the pearl, here we go, should have, should have advanced that. The second extraordinary characteristic of the pearl is that it's the only gem that cannot be improved upon by man. All other jewels can be cut and polished by skilled craftsmen to have value as gemstones. Uh, raw diamonds, for example. Did you hear about the discovery the other day in Arkansas at the diamond field? You know, there's a diamond field in Arkansas where you can go and hunt for diamonds. Somebody found this large brown diamond the other day, worth a lot of money. That was just the last couple of weeks. But they will take those diamonds and they will cut them and they will polish them and facet them. And, and then they're worth, you know, so much more. But the pearl is perfect. When it's found, you can't improve a pearl by cutting it or, or polishing it. It's reported that Cleopatra had two pearls worth $400,000 each. <clears throat> now, thirdly, the principles portrayed in the two parables, I listed four here. The central principle of both parables is the value of the kingdom. 
Jesus said about the kingdom, Seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness. Matthew 6.33. He was expressing its extreme importance. We must not allow anything to keep us out of the church or kingdom. The value of the kingdom. Let's talk about that for a minute. The value of the kingdom is seen in its price. Seen in its price. Ephesians 5, 25 and 26. Acts 20, 28. Second, the value of the kingdom is seen in its purpose. Purpose. Jesus is the Savior of the body, Ephesians 5, 23, which is the church, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, which is in fact the kingdom, Matthew 16, 18 and 19. But how many bodies are there? One, Ephesians 4, 4, and we're immersed into it. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now you're the body of Christ and members in particular. Third, the value of the kingdom is seen in the peace it provides. It provides the environment wherein we may find peace with God and ourselves. Romans 5, 1. Romans 14, 17. Philippians 4, 7. Fourth, the value of the kingdom is seen in its people. Mark 10, 29 through 30. There is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake in the gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time. Houses, brethren, sisters, uh, mothers, children, and lands with persecutions and in the world to come, eternal life. I recently spoke on a lectureship up in Farmington, Missouri, and Glenn Tattersall, Tattersall happened to be there. He was visiting from Australia. He's a missionary in Tasmania. And as we ate there together, it was just amazing how many people we both knew, mutual acquaintances. In fact, he had recently stayed in the home of dear friends of ours in Greenfield, Tennessee, who once worked in Australia for 18 months. There are brethren that can be closer to you than your own literal brother or sister. And that spiritual companionship is one of the great blessings of the kingdom. Okay, little sermon there. A secondary principle found in the parables is that the kingdom may be found in different ways. How did the man who found the treasure, how did he find it? He stumbled on it. He found it by accident. What about the pearl merchant? He searched for it. So let's go back to what I alluded to a moment ago. And this is what has always confounded me about the parable of the pearl. Jesus says the kingdom was like the treasure. And so naturally, you would assume that Jesus would have said the kingdom was like the pearl, right? But that's not what he said. Does that surprise you? I think most people have never noticed that. But he actually said the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. So rather than portraying the kingdom from the standpoint of the treasure, in parable number two, the kingdom is portrayed from the standpoint of the merchant. The kingdom is like the merchant. 
Now, if the kingdom is like the merchant in the parable, it's certainly worth studying the nature of the merchant. And Jesus attributes five actions to the merchant. He searches, he finds, he goes, he sells, he buys. How then is the kingdom of heaven like this searching, finding, going, selling, buying merchant? Well, while the primary lesson is still the value of the kingdom, I think the parable is stressing seeking out the kingdom to obtain it. I think that's the major lesson. And that's why I said in the beginning, the parable of the hidden treasure teaches the value of the kingdom. The parable of the pearl of great price teaches the value of seeking the kingdom. I think that's the difference, ever so slight as it is. That pearl merchant knew there must be a pearl of great price, and he kept seeking it. Now, it's interesting to look at the cases of conversion in the book of Acts to see how many of them are like the hidden treasure parable and then how many of them resemble the pearl of great price parable. Paul had a surprise meeting with Jesus on the Damascus road, which led him to obey the gospel when he reached Damascus in Acts 9. The Philippian jailers, special prisoners, one night, were the source of his interest in the gospel in Acts 16. Some people, by chance, a visit, a tract, a kind word from another, are brought into contact with life's most precious thing, the gospel of the kingdom. Others are aware of the needs of the soul. They seek out the kingdom. The eunuch from Ethiopia was studying about the Lamb of Isaiah 53 in Acts 8. Cornelius was a devout man searching for God in Acts chapter 10. God will reward those who diligently seek him. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Proverbs 8, 17, I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. A third principle found in these parables is the sacrifice necessary to obtain the kingdom. To get the pearl, the man had to sell all he had to buy the field. Is the kingdom worth all that we possess? Yes. The pearl merchant knew and loved pearls. He had many good pearls. However, he knew that there was a pearl above all others in value. He wasn't content with mediocrity. He wanted the best even if it cost everything that he had. The kingdom of God is so valuable that losing everything on earth but getting the kingdom is a happy trade-off. That's because eternity is at stake in those decisions. We may have to sacrifice human traditions and doctrines that produce vain worship. Matthew 15, 6 through 9. We may have to sacrifice family who reject us. When we obey the gospel, Matthew 10, 34 through 37. We may have to sacrifice material possessions if they've been more important than following Christ, Matthew 19, 21 through 22. We may have to sacrifice our career and reputation if they contradict entering and serving in the kingdom. Paul expresses this very thing in Philippians 3, 7 through 8. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ, yea, doubtless. And I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, 
For in whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. All the awards, all the applause, all the credits that were once the foundation of his righteousness and pride were removed. And when he looked at his balance sheet, he saw plainly that the gains to be found in Christ far exceeded the losses by renouncing Judaism in favor of Christianity. He is no fool to give what he cannot keep, to gain what he cannot lose. The fourth principle stress is the joy to be experienced in the kingdom of Christ. We're happy when we find treasures, whether they are never in our possession or whether we've lost them and, and later find them. For joy the man sold all that he had and he bought the field. I love thy kingdom, Lord, the house of thine abode. The church our blessed Redeemer saved with his own precious blood. I love thy church, O God, her walls before thee stand. Dear as the apple of thine eye engraven on thy hand. Verse 4. Beyond my highest joy, I prize her heavenly ways, her sweet communion, solemn vows, her hymns of love and praise. The kingdom of God is joy in the Holy Spirit, Romans 14, 17. The God of hope fills his children with joy, Romans 15, 13. One part of the fruit of the Spirit is joy, Galatians 5, 22. Paul says in Philippians 2.17, Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice in service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. I want to close out this one with two fascinating men that we meet on the pages of the New Testament. One of them died early. He died for his faith. An infuriated mob stoned him to death. And yet they could not take away his peace and his joy. He died with the prayer of Jesus on his lips. Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. He put Jesus Christ in the kingdom first. He knew its value. I'm speaking about Stephen, of course. In the other, we know as the rich young ruler. He didn't have the courage to follow Jesus. He went away sorrowful, for he had many possessions. There was joy in the heart of this man dying in the hands of a mob that the rich young ruler, with all of his riches, never knew. Will you value the kingdom? Above all else. 239. Well, this is parable number seven. The parable of the drag net. Matthew 13, 47 through 50. I have to tell some fishing jokes when I talk about the dragnet. Woman goes fishing with her husband. She's a novice. And after about an hour, she asks, Do you have any more of those small plastic floats? And he says, Why? She says, Because the one I'm using keeps sinking. I guess you got a fish to understand that one. Two city slickers go ice fishing in Minnesota. And when they got back to camp, the man in the bait shop asked, Did you catch many fish? 
And one city slicker said, no, we didn't. Why, it took us six hours to get the boat into the water. I guess you got to be a fisherman. The Lord tells this parable about fishing to teach us something about the kingdom. Let's read Matthew 13 and... Uh, you know, in, in verses 1, where was this parable told? By the seaside. And he had gone into the ship and, and sat. So that's the scene. The, um, let's see. First you have the scene net used by fishermen. Okay, someone who hasn't read, please read Matthew 13, 47 through 48, please. And the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea, and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they draw to shore, and sat down, and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. Well, one of the most lucrative industries in ancient Israel was fishing, which provided a favorite food for the Jews. And even today, fish from the Sea of Galilee is a delicacy on tables throughout the Middle East. And so important was the fishing industry that one of the gates into Jerusalem was called the Fish Gate. The New Testament describes several scenes of fishermen washing, mending, or casting their nets. The seen net, you pronounce that just like S-E-E-N. The seen net is a special kind of drag net by which several fishermen cover a bed of fish with the net and then they drag that to shore. It's a large net. It has sinkers on one edge and floats on the other that hang vertically in the water, and it's used to enclose and uh, catch fish when the ends are pulled together and it's drawn ashore. It can either be dragged between two boats or it can be laid out by a single boat and pulled to land with long ropes. When the seam net was pulled to shore, the fishermen began to clean Separate the clean fish from the unclean fish. Leviticus 11, 9 through 12, these shall you eat of all that are in the waters. Whatsoever hath fins and scales in the waters, in the seas, and in the rivers, then shall you eat. And all that have not fins and scales in the seas and in the rivers, of all that move in the waters, and of any living thing which is in the waters, they shall be an abomination unto you. They shall be even an abomination unto you. Ye shall not eat of their flesh, but ye shall have their carcasses in abomination. Whatsoever have no fins nor scales in the waters, that shall be an abomination unto you. So clean fish for those that had scales and fins. While unclean fish were those without fins and scales, such as shellfish. Now, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like this net. Jesus tells the parable of the seen net. Now, notice secondly the sorting done by angels. Verse 49 through 50. Next. Someone who hasn't read. So the kingdom is likened to a net that's cast into the sea. It gathers of every kind. And Jesus challenges those gazing out at his gently rocking boat on the Sea of Galilee full of fish to reason from the fishermen's actions and from the net 
that was used to the fact of the coming of judgment. When the wicked will end with the final severing of the wicked from the just within the kingdom. His kingdom is like a dragnet set out by a boat in a circle. And when the net's underwater, every fish cannot be seen. And, uh, and some swim away, never having been in the, in the net at all. And then when you pull it to shore, is it possible to sort out completely those trapped in the net while it's being drawn to the shore? No. But at a definite point, at some point, the fishing ceases. And then they deliberately set down to properly save the good fish in baskets while throwing the unfit ones away to die. That's the parable. Third, you have the symbolism conveyed by Jesus. In this parable, the sea represents the world that is to be evangelized. Matthew 28, 19, Mark 16, 15. Now, if you're going to be successful in fishing, you've got to equip yourselves well. In Carothersville, Missouri, where I live, we have a store that is now in an old factory. It is huge. It is called the Grizzly Jig. It is the nation's largest crappie store. Crappie fishermen from all over the country come in with their fancy trucks and their fancy boats and pull up to go in there and buy the latest lures, rods, boats, fishing equipment. Sometimes I see the truck of Wally Marshall and it says, Mr. Crappie. That's Mr. Crappie to you. He's supposed to be one of the best crappie fishermen in the world. Well, you equip yourself well, you you get the hook in the water. You're serious about catching fish. Jesus said that if his disciples would follow him, he would make them what? Fishers of men. And that also extends to you and to me. You need to catch men and bring them to the Lord. I can't allow myself to get distracted over the worms and the rocks or allow myself to be preoccupied by the cares of the world that might hinder me from my fishing business. My fishing business is my father's business. So I have to put the hook in the water. And the boat and the tackles and the bait and the outboard motor and the rods and the reels are superfluous if the fishermen does not put the hook in the water. And so it is with us. We have to put our hooks in the water and fish for men. The net represents the gospel of the kingdom and the church of the Lord. And there is in this all-embracing nature of the net the idea of the wide reach of the gospel. And as the net doesn't discriminate, we can't discriminate in preaching the gospel. Men of all types obey the gospel and become members of the church. Some remain faithful. Some of them don't. Second Peter 2 and verse 20. Not all members of the church are good. Some become bad. Some become wicked. Next, the net being full represents time when God's full purpose for redemption is realized. Matthew 13, 48, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast 
the bad away. The net will be filled when God's full purpose for redemption is realized. Then the drawing up to the beach represents the end of time and the coming judgment. And as long as the fish are in the water, they've got complete control over their movement, but when they're pulled to the beach, they're completely under the control of the fishermen. And notice also this, no fishes are taken into the vessels that had not first been in the net. And in the large analogy of the sea as the world and the net as the church and the vessels as heaven, it's, it's plain that the Lord intended to teach that membership in the church is prerequisite to enter the eternal kingdom of heaven. Only those in the net of the kingdom are taken into the vessels of heaven. 49, so shall it be at the end of the world. The angel shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. There's the final separation of the wicked, just like we saw in the parable of the tares. Just like you'll see in the parable of the talents also. And we also see in this parable that there is a time of no more fishing. No more opportunity to either get into Christ's church or to repent if wayward. The gospel net is for all, and our job is to preach to every creature in the sea of the world and to recognize you can't force people into the net, and you can't coerce them into being faithful once inside it. Coming separation in the kingdom. So what do I represent in this parable of Jesus? When it comes time for the sorting of the fish, do I belong to the good fish or to the bad fish? Am I the kind that God will accept? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. What the sea represents. The sea, the world. Uh, laborers in the vineyard, parable number eight. Moving right along. Now, this is Matthew 20, 1 through 16. Mm. President William McKinley once said to Senator Henry Cabot Lodge, for labor, a short day is better than a short dollar. What would he say to the men pictured in the Lord's parable of the laborers in the vineyard who had a long day and a short dollar? There are elements of this parable that seem to contradict what you and I know about modern labor and management in today's society. And this parable is a difficult one for many people to understand. And I want to endeavor to explain it to you from the context in which it's found and offer from it some needed applications for us. Now the text is Matthew 20, 1 through 16. And we're going to see the analogy, verse 1, the agreement, verses 2 through 7, the argument, verses 8 through 15, and the application, verse 16. First, the analogy. Matthew 20, verse 1, For the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that is a householder, 
which went out in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. So, some aspect of the kingdom, whether it be life in the kingdom, the law expected in the kingdom, or the sacrifice called for in the kingdom, is going to be discussed in this parable. A householder. That's one who's in charge of his own house, his own field, his own vineyards. And this man desiring workers for his vineyard goes out early in the day to seek those who will work. The householder represents God. God desires workers in the kingdom. Luke 10, 2. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. The place of work is the vineyard, which is the Lord's church. And one can suppose that the householder, God, in this parable, would reward the workers for labor in any other field but his own. God has not promised to reward anyone for work that he does outside his vineyard, the church. I don't care what you do for other organizations. Labor is rewarded only if it's accomplished in the Lord's vineyard. Next, you've got the agreement, 2 through 7. Okay, someone read 2 through 5. And he went on about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. And he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. About the eleventh hour. Let's stop there. So it's early morning. And uh, he finds men seeking employment. He sends them into the vineyard with the promise of certain payment that has been agreed upon. A penny for a day's labor. The denarius was the common silver Roman coin that was the daily wage of a laborer who worked a full Jewish day from sunrise to sunset. One denarius would equal about 16 cents. The good Samaritan, you remember, paid two denarii to the innkeeper, which suggests something of its purchasing power in the time of Christ. Well, he finds out he needs more workers. So at the third hour of the day, he finds men standing idle in the marketplace, and he sends them into the vineyard. But this time, what's different? What's different? Um, he said whatever is right I'll give you. Hmm? So if he's in a city, I'll give them the same amount. Yeah. So they, they is, there, is there a definite contract? No. Uh-uh. No. There is no specified contract. They're just a promise of that which is right. Okay, now let's pick up verses 6 and 7, someone. Who has not read? Go ahead, Joe. 6 and 7? Yes. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle and said unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. Now the heart of this parable has to do with the hiring of these workers. And I'm going to stop right there because the bell's about to ring, okay? So we'll pick up for our last hour when we return.
Yeah, I'll give it to you. Hey, Caleb, come here a minute.
Well, we are down to our last 46 minutes. We are studying the parables of the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. And let's see, where are we? Verse 6. Okay, someone who hasn't read. What What is your name? Mike? No. Marshall. Marshall. <laughs> I was going to call you Redbeard a while ago, but I decided not to, but Marshall. Okay. Matthew 26 through 7. At about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle, and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He, has, he said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. <coughs> The heart of this parable has to do with the hiring of these workers obtained last even at the 11th hour. The householder goes out and finds men idle and he says to them in verse 6, Why stand ye here all the day idle? And that has been the basis of many fine sermons calling the saints to be people of action. When they are questioned, what do they say? Nobody has hired us. Nobody has hired us. He then goes and hires them to go into the vineyard with the same promise as that earlier group. Whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. Now, the main thing to notice here is there are actually two kinds of workers this is what many miss. There are actually two kinds of workers. The men that were hired early in the morning would not go to work until they knew what? How much they would make. You see that? And so a penny a day was agreed between them. What about all of the other workers? They just took the job. Did they have a contract? They just trusted the owner's word and character to give them what was right. I believe this to be the key to interpreting this parable. Now let's go back and pick up the context and see the connection between the circumstances of the parable to the events that had just occurred. In Matthew 19, 20 through 21, the rich young ruler had said to Jesus, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Well, the Apostle Peter is thinking about this statement. And Peter decides that he wants to know the reward that the apostles will receive for their service to the Lord. Look now at Matthew 19, 27. And you see what I mean when I talk about context? Here's a classic example. Verse 27, then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? So he wants to know how much treasure will they have. The Jesus promised the rich young ruler, you do this and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And Peter's thinking, well, we've been here from the first. He wants to know how much treasure they'll have because the apostles forsook all and followed the Lord from what hour? The very first hour. You see? 
Now we have the argument, verses 8 through 15. Matthew 28 and 9, someone who hasn't read. Okay, how were the men paid? Okay, reverse order. Starting with the 11th hour laborers. You think they were surprised? Happily surprised? When what did they get? They got the penny. And the penny was, yeah, a penny was a day's wage. They got the amount that had been promised to the workers that were hired at the earliest time of the day. Okay, next, verses 10 and 12. Somebody that hasn't read. But when the press came, they supposed that they should have received more. And they likewise, and they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they moaned against the good man of the house, saying, These last have robbed but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have done which have borne the burden and the heat of the day. So but, here's the here's the first workers and they're talking. And they know the generosity that has been shown to the 11th hour workers. They're seeing all these people getting paid before them. And, and what, did, what did they assume? They're going to get more than what they agreed. Uh-huh. They assumed that the sum upon which they had agreed would now be multiplied. However, as each group was paid, these men saw their expected wages decrease in their minds until it was their turn in line, and what did each man receive? His penny. So what did they do? They complained. Did they have anything to complain about? Why? They had an agreement. They had a contract. Did they receive the amount that they had agreed upon? Yes. yes. All right, now 13 and 15. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Did not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that, that thine is and go thy way. I will give unto this day and this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with my own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? Now the householder answers one of them and calls him what? His friend. And he sums up his arguments in this way. I did you no wrong. Is that right? Yes. You agreed to work for a certain sum. Did he pay it? Yes. Take what you've been paid and go your way. The agreement's been kept. I'm the householder. I'm free to give to these last ones as I please, as long as I have been true in my agreement with you. I'm the householder. It's lawful for me to do what I want with my own goods. Are you going to have evil thoughts toward me when I've been good toward you? I mean, when he came to them, they didn't have a job at all, did they? So here's his reasoning. He argues against those who murmured, who were motivated by evil thinking, while he had only demonstrated goodness and generosity towards them. So the analogy, the agreement, the argument, now the application Verse 16, so the last shall be first, and the first last, for many be called, but few chosen. 
I think the central message is arrived at by, by studying what we looked at in the last part of chapter 19. Jesus told that rich young ruler, Thou shalt have treasure in heaven, come and follow me. Well, that made Peter and the other apostles ask, uh, Yeah, what shall we get? We've been with you from the first. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, knew, uh oh, we got a bad attitude here, and this needs to be corrected. And look, look again at the charge there in Matthew 20, 15. Is thine eye evil because I am good? Peter may have been envying what was offered the rich young ruler. There was an evil thought present. There was a bad attitude involved that had been perceived by the Lord in the mind of Peter. And Jesus is dealing with it here. And we see in this parable that when we start comparing, then we start coveting, and then we start complaining. And all that leads to a bitter attitude toward God. We get the feeling that God has given us a raw deal. We sort of become like the elder brother. In the parable of the prodigal son, he compared himself to his wayward brother who was receiving all those gifts and all that attention. And you remember what he said to his father? Thy brother has come, and thy and the father killed the fatted calf. He was, he was mad about it. He said, Thou never gavest me a Never gave us me a kid that I may make merry with my friends. And so this is a similar idea, I think. Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Thou never gave us me a kid. So Matthew 20 and 10, but when the first came, they supposed they should have received more. And they likewise received every man a penny. They were overconfident and they ended up being disappoint disappointed. So Jesus talked about the last being first and the first being last. These people that are first in their own eyes will be last in his eyes in that day. And some who are last in their own eyes will be first in that day. Another great lesson is, well, I put on the chart, service, not seniority in the kingdom. Service is what counts with God, not seniority. But then also another great lesson is that at the heart of Christianity is the grace of God. And the parable of the workers is a, is a powerful Lesson on the theme of God's grace. What God gives comes from his goodness. Not from what we deserve. Uh, we don't deserve anything. But by God's grace we're saved. So we got to avoid a disposition that seeks to bargain with God. Uh, look at, turn over to Romans 5 for a moment. Very quickly, turn to Romans 5 for a moment, and I want to highlight a phrase. Let's begin in Romans 5, 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath, to, uh, from wrath through him. Now verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now verse 15. But now, as the offense, so also is the 
free gift, for if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. Now, um, 17. For if by one man's <coughs> offense death reigned by one, much more than, uh, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. One more, verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. What's the key phrase? No. What's the key phrase? Hmm? What's the key phrase? What's the key phrase in all the verses he read? Much more. Much more. There you go. Much more. In every one of those verses. God will always give us much more than we deserve. Okay, got 30 minutes. Parable of the Great Supper. I really don't have time to cover it. Luke 14, 15 through 24. From this parable, we should learn that the Lord will not accept our excuses when we choose to settle for second best. First of all, Jesus pictures preparations being executed. Verse 16, Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many. This is Luke 14, 16. Made a great supper, invited many. The man symbolizes God the Father. The making of the supper, the Father's preparation for the coming of Christ across the centuries. The supper is the manifold blessings of the gospel. The inviting of many reveals the breadth of God's love. And it's interesting that Christ compares salvation to a feast. He knows that as lost sinners, people are hungry and thirsty and ready to die. The water of this world does not satisfy. The bread that people buy at a dear price can never meet their spiritual needs. Most of the people we know are spending money for that which is not bread. As Isaiah said in Isaiah 55 and verse 2. Now, uh, this is a meaningful picture of salvation to me. I have never gone out and searched for a lost sheep. I have never found a pearl a great price. But I have sat down at a good meal and enjoyed the food. And you and I can identify with this kind of illustration. Salvation, like food at a meal, has to be received within. You could have a hungry guest sit at a table and admire the food and yet starve to death. Jesus is the bread of life, but he's got to be received within before he, he can save us. John 6, 48 through 51. But the main point is, this feast is prepared by God and sinners need to come and dine. That's the main point. There are two little words there that stand out in verse 17. All and now. God has done all that was needed to be done to save lost sinners. The table is spread with all that we need Forgiveness, 
reconciliation, adoption, fellowship with God, peace of mind, joy in Christ, and much more. All the blessings are represented in this great supper, and it is now ready. It's all ready now. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 2. Now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Second, Jesus pictures invitations being extended. Verses 16 and 17, Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper, and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. So in Jesus' day, when you invited guests to a dinner, you told them the day, but not the exact hour. A host had to know how many guests were coming so he could butcher the right amount of animals and prepare sufficient food. Just before the feast was to begin, the host sent his servants out to each of the guests to tell them, okay, the banquet's ready. You come. So each of these guests had already agreed to attend the banquet. The host expected them to be there. The servant is Christ, Philippians 2.7. Those bidden or invited are the Jews, Matthew 10.5-7. They've been told about the feast by the prophets and John the Baptist. And now the kingdom is at hand. And Christ would invite them to come through the preaching of the gospel in Acts 2. Verse 18, they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. So he uses his possession to excuse himself. He begs off because he has to go and see a piece of real estate that he had purchased. Anybody who purchases land that he has never examined needs to have his head examined. <laughs> you are taking a chance. How many allow their possessions to come before their salvation. What, what did Lot do? Where did he pitch his tent? Towards Sodom. Toward Sodom. How often is the care of the church property more important than attending Bible study or worship services? Or my own property? Oh, I got to mow my yard. I got to rake my leaves. Think about the rich man in Luke 16. The rich man was rich. Lazarus was a beggar. But in the next world, who became the beggar? The rich man did. What a switch. What a switch. He had trusted his riches and lived for them and left God out of his life. The beggar was poor in material things, but he was rich in spiritual things. We must not use our possessions to excuse us from the Great Supper. Verse 19, another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. You purchase ten oxen, and you haven't looked at them or tested them? Here's the man going to sell you a used car. Are you going to take that out for a test drive? Yes. Well, of course you are. And how could he really put those oxen to the test so late in the day? I cannot come. I've got to go to work. Or I cannot come. My job makes me so tired. and So on and so on and so on. 20, another said, I've married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. He used his relations to excuse himself. 
Having a new wife would have kept a man from the battlefield, according to Deuteronomy 24, 5, but not from this supper. Years ago, when the Gus Os were working as missionaries in Hong Kong, they met a young Japanese lady that had become a Christian. She was attending the Christian college over there. Her name was Hisoka-san. When she became a Christian, her parents disowned her. In fact, they had a mock funeral. They said she was dead. They would never have a thing to do with her anymore. They would not speak to or recognize her in any way. Our brethren had to take her in. And the Oves had to pay her way in school, even though they were doing mission work in Hong Kong. And that young Christian had a very heavy cross to bear, but she was willing to carry the load. She didn't use her relations to excuse her from the Great Supper. These people which Jesus pictured did not reject the invitation because they were involved in bad activities, right? There's nothing essentially wrong in buying real estate or in plowing or enjoying your home. They were just too involved in the everyday affairs of life and too busy to think seriously about what they were doing and they made excuse. Moving on, Jesus pictures condemnation being expressed, verse 21. So the servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. God was angry. Now his invitation went to the Jews first, and when they rejected Christ, he then went to the publicans and the sinners and the Samaritans. 22, and, and the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. Now the Gentiles, those afar off, would be offered the blessings of salvation. They would be compelled or persuaded to come. Why did they accept the invitation as outsiders when the insiders refused it? Well, they knew what their need was. And, and they weren't making excuses. 24. For I say to you that none of these men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. These Jews, like the scribes and the Pharisees, the priests, when told, hey, it's time to come to the table. Did they come? Some did, but for the most part, no. Why? They liked better the table where they were. They refused to accept Jesus and his message. And the Lord was warning the Jews that when they rejected him, God was going to extend the invitation to the Gentiles, and that's just what he did. However, there's a personal lesson here that no one should trifle with the gospel invitation because the next thing the Lord did was close the door. So this is a lesson in opportunity. There is a song that we sing that's written from this parable. Do you know what it is? Mm -hmm. All things are ready. Urging people to come to the Lord while they have time and opportunity. We're, we're close, but I don't know. Number 10. Can you believe we're doing 10 parables today? That's a lot. I can tell it in my throat too. 
The parable of the wicked husbandman. This is Mark 12, 1 through 12. This is delivered on, thir on Tuesday, just prior to the Lord's death. The disposition of the leaders against Jesus was intensifying. The chief priests and the elders had called into question the authority of Christ. And this parable reveals the Jewish rejection of the prophets through history and the impending rejection of the Messiah and the consequences they would suffer. All right, let's see, let's put the outline up. The setting of the hedge, verse 1. And he began to speak unto them by parables. A certain man planted a vineyard and set an hedge about it, and digged a place for the wine fat, and built a tower, and led it out to husbandmen, and went into a far country. Now, there's no chapter division here. From the context, he's speaking to the same people, including the Sanhedrin, in the same place, which was the temple. And they had refused to acknowledge Christ's greatness, and so he spoke to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. That's just as common in Palestine as wheat fields are in Kansas, or corn fields are in Illinois, or cotton fields are around my house. The man represents God. The vineyard represents Israel, is God's covenant people under the Mosaic dispensation. They're expected to bear fruit for God. The man set a hedge or a fence of stone to protect the vineyard against thieves and animals. God protected Israel from the surrounding nations. He digged in a place for the wine fat or the wine press, that would consist of two excavations in the ground lined with stone, and grapes were placed in it, and they were crushed by feet, and then the juice would run down through a pipe to two lower compartments and then put into jars. He then built a tower, that's a watchtower, where the watchman could warn about danger from thieves and animals. It's pretty obvious. This is not just some backyard grapevine, is it? This is a big deal. Then he let it out to husbandmen. He leased the vineyard to sharecroppers. They were to do the work and then receive part of the fruit. So the husbandmen represent the leaders of the Jewish nation. He went into a far country, and that's a picture of God waiting for Israel to develop spiritually. Now you have the sending of the servants, verses 2 through 5. And at the season he sent to the husbandman a servant, that he might receive from the husbandman of the vineyard, of the fruit of the vineyard. Uh, according to Leviticus 19, 23 and 25, it was not until the fifth year that they could eat. Fifth year. Whenever harvest time came, he sent a servant to receive his portion, which was rightfully his. I think the servants would represent God's prophets sent to Israel, like Samuel and Nathan and Micaiah and Elijah and Elisha, the 16 writing prophets from Isaiah to Malachi. Verse 3, And they caught him and beat him, and sent him away. They renege on the deal. They want to keep it all. So you wonder what the reaction of the owner will be. You think swift, sure punishment for sure. Verse 4, and again he sent unto them another servant. And at him they cast stones and wounded him in the head and sent him away shamefully handled. And again he sent another. And him they killed and many others, beating some, killing some. What's all this a picture of? Israel's treatment of God's prophets. Zechariah was stoned with stones. Jeremiah was cruelly abused and tortured. Isaiah was believed to have been sawn asunder in a tree by order of King Manasseh. 
Then the sending of the Son, verses 6 through 9. Having yet therefore one Son, his well-beloved, he sent him also last unto them, saying, They will reverence my Son. So here's the climax of the parable. Who's the Son, the well-beloved? That's Jesus. He sent last to the Jews. Surely they won't hurt the owner's son. By the way, I want to say that does not support the notion of a surprising rejection of Jesus by the Jews, does it? Not at all. Not at all. Verse 7, but those husbandmen said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance shall be ours. Here they are plotting against Christ to kill him. Verse 8, they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. Where was Jesus crucified? Outside the city, Outside the city walls. Hebrews 13, 12 through 13. Verse 9, what shall therefore the Lord of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the husbandman and will give the vineyard unto others. So what effect does this have on the Lord of the vineyard? Well, obviously they, they knew, verse 41, they say to him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Well, they were right. They pronounced their own doom. Because in less than four decades, Caesar would send Titus to crush them. And great would be the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple on Mount Moriah. To whom was the vineyard given? To Jews and Gentiles who accepted Christ and the gospel. Finally, the setting aside of the stone. And have you not read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our Eyes. Three, uh, I, won't talk, I won't take the time to talk about the cornerstone, but the rejected stone, of course, would become the cornerstone. Jesus being the chief cornerstone, Ephesians 2 and verse 20. Three key lessons from this parable. Number one, God's patience. His people are to bear fruit. Israel failed to do that. His patience could have run out when the first servant came back and was beaten and returned empty-handed. But you see God's long-suffering, right? You see it in the flood. You see it in the ample opportunities which they had. And you also see it in God's long-suffering to us, 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. And then also God's pun punishment. What happens to God's patience? One day, it runs out. So it's a mistake to emphasize God's love, goodness, and grace to neglect of his holiness, righteousness, and wrath. God destroyed the husbandman. There came a time when his patience was exhausted. Verse 12, And they sought to lay hold on him, but feared the people, for they knew that he had spoken the parable against them, and they left him and went their way. Well, they, they were perceptive enough to see themselves in this parable. They would have arrested him right then. But they were afraid of the crowd. Uh, the last parable that I wanted to do today is the parable of the seed that groweth secretly. Believe it or not, I've covered everything I wanted to cover. This is the last one. This is parable number 11. 11. The parable of the seed that groweth secretly. Now this is another parable that emphasizes the gradual growth of the kingdom. Here's your chart. The seed works secretly. Mark 4.26. He said, so is the kingdom of God. As if a man should cast seed into the ground 
The ground represents the good soil of the previous parable. Those who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit, Mark 4.20. This is like... Um, this is like a supplement to the sower. Okay? It's supplementary to that of the sower. It sort of completes the history of the growth of the good seed, which fell on the good ground. Verse 27, And should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. The seed sown, it works its power, its action does not depend on the sower. No one can explain how things grow. You can take a seed into a laboratory and you can analyze it, but the scientists cannot tell what makes that seed turn into a flower. A, a farmer can do a lot of things to the soil. He can plow it, he can fertilize it. He can often weed it out after the seed is, the seed is sown, but he can't make the seed grow. He sows it, he sleeps, he rises night and day, he leaves the rest up to God. And in the spiritual kingdom, growth takes place due to the operation of God. 1 Corinthians 3, 6, I have planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. Number two, the kingdom grows gradually. Mark 4, 28, for the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, First the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. You got the law of progressive growth here. The growth of the kingdom is gradual. It's also true of the Christian. Again, that emphasizes the attitude of patience. You got to be aware of uh, beware of expecting too much too soon. Sometimes that's a problem. Stable growth is gradual in nature. Don't try to force growth through unnatural measures and schemes and methods. And when you understand these things, that helps prevent discouragement. You've got to prepare the soil. You have to sow the seed. And it takes time to germinate. It takes time to grow the production of faith in the human heart. And then third, the harvest comes eventually, but when the fruit is brought forth immediately, he putteth in the sickle because the harvest is come. Uh, there's differing, differing opinions there. Some say that's the harvest uh, in the gathering of souls in the kingdom of Christ. Others say it refers to the second coming when Christians shall be gathered. So it refers either to the gathering of saints to glory or the gathering of men to Christ. Four lessons which we learn from this parable. The seed must be sown before a harvest can be affected. The power resides in the seed, not in the sower. The heart must exercise itself in response to the truth, and we must be patient with those who are growing toward obedience. Yes. Um, Sir, with uh, John 15, Jesus talking about he being the vine, and the power of the vine dresser, is it is that a way that you can link the two in any way? That you will not still miss the point in it? Maybe. Because I heard um, someone talking about um, God um, having Israel as his vineyard. But because they rejected him, he made his son the, the vine. Oh, okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah. First you start with Israel mm -hmm. and then their rejection. Mm -hmm. Then you go to John 15 to finish with Christ as the vine and we being members of it. Yeah. 
But truly, the parables of Jesus were stories that changed the world. I want to encourage you to do your own study of the parables of Jesus. Seek out wisdom and understanding from them. And the lessons that Christ built into them are truly profound. They are worthy of our attention. Think about the people in the days of old who would have dreamed about being able to study them as we have today. I want to close today with these words of Luke 10, 23 through 24. And he turned unto his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that ye see. For I tell you, that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. It's been my joy today to spend the entire day with the whole student body and study these parables with you. Uh, I have a surprise for you, and that is I'm going to give the PowerPoint to Caleb, and then he will share it with all of you. Thank you, brother. You're welcome. Enjoy being with you. Thank you. Thank you so much.